Welcome, everyone. We are happy to um, have you join us today for the final day of our P2P workshop on rural telehealth. Today is day three of three. We're happy to have you all with us. Uh, if you haven't been with us the past two days, my name is Kate Winsick, and I'm the P2P workshop coordinator uh, for this Pathways to Prevention workshop. Uh, so first, we'd like to do a very quick review of a couple housekeeping slides, and then we will we will review items from day one and day two, and then. Um, we will begin. And Catherine, you're going to advance the slides. Yes, I am. Okay, great. You can do the next one. Okay. Okay, so oh, there are a couple of items you can find, actually a lot of um, resources you can find on our website at the um, Office of Disease Prevention. Website, the workshop agenda, speaker bios, uh, workshop resources, um, and also a link to the systematic evidence review which is open for public comment right now. So all of those resources can be found at that link there at the bottom. Next. Okay, so how to comment and ask questions today. We, um, we welcome all, any and all questions from our audience today. You can use the WebEx Q&A pod to do so. And when you submit a comment, if you can put the name of the speaker who you're directing the comment to, uh, and then hit, and then submit the question to all panelists. And again, that's in the Q&A pod. You can also send us an email at nhp2p at mail.nih.gov or join the conversation on Twitter. Next slide. If you have any technical difficulties, use the WebEx chat pod. Um, and so that's only for technical difficulties or you can send us an email. And both the Q&A and the chat pod can be found at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Next. Okay, we have closed captions available for this workshop in the multimedia viewer, at, again, at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx window. So if you'd like to use the captions, click on the multimedia viewer. Next. And then zooming in on content, you can do on your own. So if some of the slides you're viewing um, seem to be a little small. You can hover your cursor on the left side of your screen and a magnifying glass will appear and you can make the, the text bigger in the WebEx window. Next. Okay, we have a couple of opportunities for comment. The first one I already mentioned, uh, we again welcome everyone to review and comment on the draft systematic evidence review, which was prepared by the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center. And the link can be found on the Office of Disease Prevention website at prevention.nih.gov backslash P2P Rural Health. Um, and then the second opportunity for comment is not immediately. But in a couple of months, the, um, you will be able to review and comment on the panel's draft report. The panel that is overseeing this workshop today will spend the next month or so preparing a draft report, we'll, which will also be open for public comment for about a month. Um, it will summarize the workshop and provide recommendations for future research priorities. It'll be available roughly winter 2021, we're hoping February, uh, again on the ODP website. We will send a note out to all workshop attendees when that's available. Next slide. Okay, and then lastly, please complete the post workshop survey at the conclusion of today, the end of the workshop, all registered attendees will receive an email from NHP2P Logistics at west.com with the survey link. And we would appreciate it if you took the time, it only takes about five to 10 minutes. And we found with past surveys, we've really been able to improve the, the um, P2P program because of the results we get. So we would appreciate it. I think that's the last slide. Yep, yeah, okay, great. Uh, one last reminder that all attendees are automatically muted today, so you don't need to worry about that. And I will now turn the workshop over to Dr. Mary Wakefield, who is our workshop and panel chair, to give us a brief overview of the past two days. Thanks, Dr. Wakefield. You bet, and thanks, Kate. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're delighted you're with us. Uh, as Kate indicated, this, of course, is the third of three days of this workshop. Uh, the framing of the workshop has been around four key questions one of which we'll get to, the last one today, two of which we covered yesterday. In yesterday's conversation, those two questions focused uh, primarily on, uh, first of all, effectiveness of provider-to-provider -provider telehealth for rural patients. That was uh, the second of the four questions. And then the third of the four questions also discussed yesterday had to do with the, the effectiveness of strategies, as well as the barriers and facilitators to implementing and sustaining a provider to provider telehealth in rural areas. So those were the questions from yesterday in that we went into a full robust discussion about. 
uh, along with uh, some great presentations. And we also had the uh, benefit of having Dr. Kara James with us, who leads Grantmakers in Health, to talk about issues around equity and health equity and how it relates to the use of telehealth. Today, we'll refocus our attention to the fourth and the last uh, uh, key question. This one focuses explicitly on methodological weaknesses of studies. What are they in this space uh, that is related to provider to provider uh, uh, telehealth for rural uh, patients, as well as a focus on what types of improvements in those research designs could occur uh, that could Im increase the impact of future research. So um, that's our focus today is on methodological weaknesses and strategies for improving uh, future research going forward in this really important area of provider to provider uh, telehealth applications. So that's the com those are comments on about the content, uh, both related to yesterday and today. In terms of process, we will have, as you'll see from the agenda, and as you'll see just a little bit later, uh, a discussion uh, um, a, a discussion is on the agenda. In that discussion period, I'll start by calling on my expert panel colleagues uh, first to ask questions and share observations in response to uh, the presenters. And then as we have time, we'll go ahead and, and take up uh, any questions from the audience. So certainly don't hesitate to use the uh, Q&A function uh, on your screens. With that, Kate, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much again to everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Wakefield. Um, Dr. Annette Totten will be our first presenter on key question four. She will present the systematic evidence review findings from our fourth and final key question. Dr. Totten, you may begin. Okay, so good morning. Um, for those of you who were here yesterday, I'm starting off the day again. I'm an associate professor at Oregon Health and Science University and an investigator with the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center. If you'd go to the next slide. Um, my team and I don't have any financial interest to disclose. We do need to say that the presentation and the report are our work and are not the um, endorsed by AHRQ or NIH, even though they do provide the funding for this work. If you could go to the next slide. So, as mentioned, this systematic review had four key questions. Um, We've worked through the uptake, key question one, the effectiveness and implementation. And today um, we're looking at the methodological weaknesses in the studies and in the body of literature. And I have to say, this is unusual that that is a key question in a systematic review. Often that's touched on in the discussion, but not necessarily explored systematically. So if you'd go to the next slide. Um, so, I'm going to briefly just remind people of the methods. If you'd go to the next slide, the full systematic review methods, there was an overview in the first presentation. If you are interested, you can go back to that. And there's an ex exhaustive amount of detail in the draft report, and it will also be in the final report. Just quickly, this is a presentation based on the draft report, which will be updated through the literature through October 2021 which is when this workshop is happening. So we update the literature through the workshop and that when selecting the studies that we pulled these methodological issues out of, we followed standards set by ARC, which include dual review of abstracts and full text. If you go to the next slide. So there are some specific differences um, for this key question. One is we basically took a two pronged approach. First of all, those of you who spend time reading research know that um, know that a lot of times authors mention some of the challenges in the limitation section. So we as we were reading the effectiveness studies and the other studies we included, we abstracted the weaknesses noted by the researchers themselves. But then as part of a systematic review, we evaluate methodological weaknesses as part of the process. Studies are assessed for risk of bias using criteria related to the types of studies they are. So the criteria for an RCT is a little different than the criteria for an observational study. We then also do an assessment on the level of the body of evidence, that is the group of similar studies. And we look at both the methodological implications 
limitations, sorry, not implications, and the um, conclusions. And then we also consider applicability. That is um, how the studies compare to populations that people might want to talk about. One of the things that I'm not going to cover in this presentation, but that if you're interested in the discussion section of the report, we do also try to identify gaps in terms of what topics are or are not covered that we expected to see. If you'd go to the next slide. So to get to the results, um, first I'm going to give some overview results of the challenges identified. You'd go to the next slide. So basically, and this has come up with several speakers, one of the challenges is that telehealth is not a single thing. And even though we've narrowed it to provider to provider telehealth, it's a very wide range from very intensive technologies like remote ICUs to text messages to provide education and support to providers in rural areas. And so it's sometimes hard to conceptualize a research agenda for such a wide range of interventions and that comparisons across the uses might not be appropriate. So that's something to think about. Another key challenge has to do with the outcomes. I mean, as we also have discussed through this workshop, one of the considerations in rural telehealth is access and telehealth is proposed as a way to improve access. But access may or may not be enough and that's something we need to decide and if access isn't sufficient, then studies um, need to include outcomes that are appropriate for the type of telehealth intervention. If you could go to the next slide. So when we think about study limitations or the evidence, we look at individual study designs, both the type of studies, the size, whether they're single site or multiple site studies, what biases are addressed or not, and um, we'll talk about those. Then we also look at the individual study conduct. One of the difficulties sometimes in the literature is getting a clear picture of what exactly the intervention is and what it's being compared to. While this is improving, a lot of studies cite usual care without being clear what that is. And in telehealth, what's interesting is sometimes you can't tell whether the study is comparing to something that happens in person to telehealth or whether it's comparing telehealth to the service not happening, the consultation not happening, or the education not happening. So that can be a, a challenge in this particular literature. And then when we start to look across studies to talk about the confidence in the body of evidence, one of the things I just want to clarify, if you do look at the report, is that's not about whether the telehealth works. It's about how stable the conclusion seems to be across the studies and how likely we think a new, large, couple of good, rigorous studies could possibly change the result. So when we talk about body of evidence and whether it's a low strength of evidence or moderate strength of evidence or strong or high strength of evidence, it's not about whether the studies have a positive effect. It's about how stable the results appear. If you'd go to the next slide. So study design considerations are big and people often see um, pyramids or diagrams like this about showing that RCTs are considered sort of the gold standard for reducing bias, and that's true. You randomize things so that you try to distribute the bias equally. Um, but you can have very strong studies in other designs. So we don't focus only on one design. We do try to evaluate the strength of that design. Um, one comment I think I made earlier, but I want to reiterate, is a lot of the studies of telehealth are these before-after studies. So they measure an outcome before tel the remote ICU program is set up and then after, mortality, length of stay. Um, but there's often no consideration of the fact that the populations are different or things may have changed. I mean, in an extreme example, you could imagine that the results would be very different if the before period was pre-COVID and the after was post-COVID. Um, so it's one of the challenges in this particular field. If you'd go to the next slide. But there are some encouraging things. Um, we did find more RCTs than we have in the past. So there are some stronger designs being studied. This slide shows the designs by the four major settings that we looked at, which 
was covered in the second presentation, we split the literature into inpatient, outpatient, emergency, and education and mentoring. And this basically um, shows the distribution of the different study designs. So, for example, the education, the ECHO programs, a lot of those use a pre-post design. They survey the participants before the study or before the intervention related to their knowledge or behavior, and then they survey them after. But it is encouraging to see that designs are improving. If you'd go to the next slide. Another consideration is sample size. Um, sometimes smaller studies are less stable. The estimates are not as precise. There's a wide range of sample sizes, and you'll see these, the huge one that's uh, an outlier there is the claims data that was looking at um, use of telestroke that looked at all Medicare claims for several years. But most studies are on the smaller side, so we wanted to give you a range and give you an idea. They are um, the largest group of studies in this literature were between 100 and um, 500 participants. So that's that's sort of in the moderate size and that's encouraging as well. If you'd go to the next slide. Another study design consideration and one that I'm happy to see improving is the use of single site versus multi-sites. One of the concerns is when studies are only done in one hospital or one outpatient clinic or one um, even health system is that the results aren't transferable to others. And so it's useful if studies include multiple sites um, in order to look at that. And we see that that's happening for um, more and more telehealth studies. If you would go to the next slide. I'm not going to turn this into a, um, <laughs> a research methods class. But I just want to say that um, one of the concerns, what we worry about when we talk about the quality of studies is bias. That is, do we think the answer that we got is real? And there are lots of different types of biases that, and different ways that studies can control for them. Selection bias is about how you get people into the study and are they being picked in a way that might influence the um, outcomes. I'm oversimplifying quite a bit. But performance bias, you know, has to do with how people um, respond to being studied and whether people measure things differently if they know what group people are in. Attrition bias, we lose people and do we lose them equally or is there a reason we're losing people and we're only, you know, getting results for the happy people or the people who had good outcomes. And then there are lots of other ways that the analyses can either add to or address biases. If you go to the next slide. And then detection bias, you know, what we can and can't measure. Like I said, I'm not gonna delve into these a lot, but in the report, what we did is we tried to map the types of biases to some of the issues that we saw in the studies. If you go to the next slide. Once we go from an individual study to a group of studies, we talk about the strength of evidence. And so that's sort of the quality of the body of evidence. And we make an assessment about that based on methodological weaknesses that we've been talking about. So are the 10 studies on remote ICUs, um, you know, what's the risk of bias overall? What do we think about their designs? But we also look at consistency of results. You know, if you have 10 studies and they all have a similar result, you're more confident than if they have conflicting results. We look at the precision of the outcome estimates, that is, you know, how stable do they look? Are the sample sizes adequate? Are they statistically significant? How wide are the confidence intervals? And then we try to think about publication bias, but it's a very hard thing to measure. And this is the idea that people tend to publish results, studies with positive results, and don't necessarily publish studies with either negative results or um, findings that things are equivalent. If you go to the next slide. So uh, the one of the other additional things we think about is applicability. And in going through this literature, some key considerations are about the diversity across rural settings. There's no such thing as like one type of rural. Um, the diversity of the technological options, um, even within a specific use. So using the remote ICU um, 
example, there are systems that are the robot. We saw in a presentation yesterday that moves from room to room. There are systems that are hardwired and sort of how those are used and how, what it takes to implement them is very different. And then, of course, we have this issue of a pandemic in the middle of all of this that has changed a lot of things. If you would go to the next slide. So additional um, limitations that we found as we were both reading what other people said and looking at across the literature is there really isn't always a consistent agreement about what the goals and outcomes of some of the telehealth intervention should be. Um, Almost no studies conceptualize telehealth as potentially being harmful or even um, enumerate unintended consequences that they measure. We're getting better about this, but sometimes you can't tell a lot about the telehealth interventions, like what, how intense they are, or for example, the remote ICU example, it might say remote ICU, but it doesn't really tell you how it's set up. And similarly, as I mentioned, sometimes you don't know what's being compared, the usual care consideration. Um, next slide. So additional considerations, oops, um, yes, sorry. Um, so, you know, some of this is not surprising that trying to promote the strongest possible research designs with adequate sample sizes, and thinking about ways to add randomization in. You can randomize clusters. You can also do sort of wait list um, randomization. That is, if you know you're going to implement a telehealth program in 20 clinics, you could do it in a random order and look at the impact. So there are ways to maybe add some rigor that aren't too onerous. We do know that you can't randomize everything. Um, requiring or pushing people to describe their interventions more clearly, to be clear about the goals. If the goal is as good as, be clear about that and make sure that it has a non-inferiority design. If the goal is better, you know, what's the rationale for thinking that telehealth is going to make the outcomes better? And then looking at multiple time points, um, we also mentioned a, in a couple presentations yesterday, like maybe the telestroke, maybe the outcome of hospital mortality is too soon, we should be looking at function three months post stroke, or maybe we need to look at points over time for some of these interventions to see if there is a sort of a historical effect. If you did the pre post study, can you look at two or three pre times and two or three post times? So you sort of have an idea of what the trend was before telehealth was implemented. If you could go to the next slide. So to wrap things up, a couple of quick conclusions. <laughs> Next, last slide with real content is that, you know, not surprising, I'm a researcher and we almost always say this, right? That the evidence could be improved by addressing some of the methodological weaknesses. And I think sort of the underlying issue for most of the literature is that it's difficult to attribute the impact of outcomes to telehealth when the study designs are weaker, when the sample sizes are smaller. Um, and then there are limitations in our data, and I'm kind of hoping that the one of the maybe small silver linings of the pandemic will be that we'll have some more data um, and some prospective data that people have been collecting data as they've been rolling out telehealth programs quickly. There has been some effort to collect data, and that may help improve the quality of information that we have. Next slide. So, as mentioned, um, this is a draft report. This is the last presentation you'll hear from me until the lightning round. And um, if you have the time and inclination, it would be very helpful to get comments on the draft report. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Totten. As you commented, that's your fourth and final presentation for the evidence review for this workshop. So, thank you very much for all of your hard work on it. Um, our second presentation uh, from Key Question 4 will be titled Methodological Weaknesses, Studies of P2P Telehealth for Rural Patients, Cancer Prevention and Control Example, given by Dr. Elizabeth Krupinski. Thank you, Dr. Krupinski. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Uh, next slide. I have nothing to disclose, fortunately or unfortunately. Next slide. So, rationale. 
Yeah, cancer research is absolutely critical, um, but you know, even under the best of circumstances, it's incredibly difficult to conduct um, for a whole variety of reasons, given the, the complexity of the specialty, the, the health status of the patients and so on. Uh, and as a result, part, partially of this, and for a lot of other reasons, you know, a lot of the clinical trials are conducted in urban areas where the academic and other large medical centers are located. It's just a, a fact of life. And this almost by necessity excludes a lot of rural areas and frontier populations as subjects participating in, the, in these studies. And this, this has been a problem to date. Now, this obviously can potentially bias the results and clearly the generalizability of the results. Telemedicine is a really great opportunity uh, to enhance clinical trials, especially cancer trials, um, by utilizing telemedicine as a tool to carry out the cancer research trials. Not necessarily have the focus on telemedicine per se, but utilizing it as a way to help conduct the trials. It can help you coordinate uh, the provider-to-provider -provider interactions, as well as the actual outreach to the patients. Uh, but you really do need to concentrate on the study designs, taking into account um, a lot of the stuff you're going to hear this morning um, that Annette presented, as well as the, the speakers that have come after me. Because in order to really conduct effective research while incorporating this new tool as a mode to help conduct the trials, it really can have an impact and sometimes good, sometimes bad. So we really have to think innovatively while relying on our traditional methods. Next slide. Now, some of the challenges Annette kind of already uh, highlighted, but especially with cancer trials, they, they, some of these are, are incredibly important. So longitudinal studies are absolutely required. I mean, three to six month studies, especially with our advances in cancer care and helping patients live longer, it really does not capture uh, the full picture from, from the patient's point of view, the provider's point of view, and so on. Um, telemedicine can help with solving challenges associated with team care coordination. It's tough in real life uh, to get everybody on the cancer team together. I mean, you've got radiology, oncology, radiation, oncology, nutrition. You've got so many different people interacting with the patient and their family as well as each other um, that it can often be a challenge in real life. And telemedicine uh, is one way to potentially address some of these challenges. Um, another challenge is uh, multiple EMRs, uh, multiple databases, especially when you try to accomplish what we're trying to say here today, which is include more sites, include the rural sites, include the frontier sites. Obviously, a lot of these smaller sites are not going to have the big EMRs that everyone else has, and communication between EMRs is notoriously a problem, and it really becomes an issue when you're trying to conduct clinical trials and coordinate clinical data with research data. There's a lot of specialty specific metrics with regards to success and improvement. Radiology success is different from oncology, is different from uh, you know, radiation oncology and so on. So we really have to concentrate on how do we merge these metrics and get an overall global picture of what's happening with the care and the outcomes of the cancer patient. Uh, we really need to figure out what some team-based measures and metrics are. Again, as I noted, it's, it's team care coordination in cancer. So are there common metrics that we can devise that cover the entire team somehow as it relates to uh, patient outcomes? The effect sizes are typically rather small, um, and the necessary requirements to, to get good statistics, power, et cetera, we really do need large samples obviously benefiting from the participation of rural and frontier patients, but again, it's hard to get them involved. Um, we also need to understand and quantify the exact role of telemedicine. Like I said, telemedicine can be the focus of your study. It is a telemedicine intervention, or telemedicine can be used as a tool to help you conduct the trials. And I think to some extent that fundamentally may change the design of the study, at least some of the goals of the study and how things are measured. Uh, technology and telecommunications really can end up being a problem. We like to think of telemedicine anywhere, anytime for anyone, but I think really the pandemic has highlighted the fact that eh, it's not so much. There's huge disparities in terms of the technologies that people have available to them, not only in rural and frontier areas, but even in urban areas. And cancer patients, to some extent, 
really may be impacted more by this as well, especially with mobility issues. Um, post sustainability uh, and continuity of care, once the study's over, what happens? Uh, and I think this kind of hits a lot of different studies, but it's you know particularly relevant to cancer patients um, because they're looking for potentially continuity of care throughout their lifetime. Cancer can be cured, but you've always got it in the back of your mind. Is it coming back? So these are just some of the challenges that are pertinent to cancer studies in general. Uh, next slide. So some of the ways you can improve your study design, some recommendations, well, pilot studies, uh, especially with rural and frontier sites and, and you know, typical sites that haven't usually participated in, in clinical trials. You really have to run some pilot studies to identify where telemedicine can actually be used to help facilitate the clinical trial, because it may or may not be appropriate for every aspect of the study. Uh, you want to have plans in place to provide technology and connectivity for those who don't have a, a laptop loan problem, a program, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, a, a cell phone, a smartphone to give to your patients and so on. So you got to think about these issues in advance. You want to have dedicated staff. Um, you know, a lot of times people think of clinical trials as, as just the providers. It's not just the providers. Um, you want to have a dedicated staff during, before, after the trial, and really personnel on that tech side, which you normally wouldn't have in a clinical trial. And the example that I'm going to talk about really highlights the importance of this. Having standard operating procedures, templates, tools for absolutely everything. People in large academic medical centers, we, we've got clinical uh, coordinators. We've got people who are used to this. There's infrastructure in place. The minute you reach out to rural areas, smaller sites, they don't have the infrastructure. They haven't done clinical trials in the past. You have to rely on you being the organizer and the one providing all the guidance and the tools for them to participate in the study because they're not going to have done this before. Um, you want to use as much as you can familiar and easy access tools, for example, REDCap. But again, you may have to train the participants at the rural sites to be able to enter data and so on into these systems because it's not easy and accessible for them. They, they haven't done it before. You want to try to go with a single site IRBs and reliance agreements. That's something to consider. Um, sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not uh, to have a single site IRB. Uh, I found that they they can take a little bit longer uh, when you when you're doing that reliance agreements, but in the end, I think it's probably worth it. And again, plan longitudinally. Uh, you got to think about a study and the implications that go on in time. And train, train, train. And I don't mean choo choo trains here. I mean train everybody associated with your trial, whether it's it's the study coordinators, the PIs, the technologists who are going to be involved. I mean, everybody has to be trained and trained well in order to make things go well. And again, especially when you're involving rural sites in clinical trials, especially with cancer care, um, because they, ha they haven't done this before. Next slide. So I wanna give you a, a, an example study, and this was a, a study that was carried out um, mainly by Bob Krauss um, and uh, a team of multi-site folks. It's uh, on ostomy telehealthcare for cancer survivors. And the University of Arizona and the Arizona Telemedicine Program functioned as the telemedicine uh, glue for this entire trial. So next slide. Basically, it was a, a three-year randomized controlled trial that was looking at the effectiveness of an ostomy training program uh, on survivorship, activation, self-efficacy, uh, quality of life, and so on. And there were 162 patients. And again, the focus of this study was not telemedicine per se. Telemedicine was used as a tool to help implement uh, this study. Uh, the intervention integrated goal setting and problem solving approaches to enhance um, survivor activation and their self-efficacy to carry out their ostomy care. Um, a lot of cancer patients uh, end up with ostomies after their um, procedures and go home, especially if you're in a rural area, there's not a lot of help around to, to help you figure out you know, how to adjust to life with this new problem. The curriculum was delivered over four group sessions uh, administered by a trained ostomy certified nurses and peer uh, ostomates. 
Um, additional sessions were given to caregivers as they needed them. And telehealth came into play, again, to enhance the program delivery to the participants across three very different geographic areas and two time zones, um, trying again to involve as many patients in different backgrounds as possible. The participants were able to join in this real-time conferencing setting from home, and that's where the telemedicine came into play. Next slide. So one of the major challenges that patients face again is traveling to group sessions um, to figure out uh, you know, how to get there. And again, when you're in a rural area, even sometimes in an urban area, it's hard to get to a session. Uh, you've got your ostomy, you may have a caregiver, it's just complicated and you may not have access uh, to transportation. So you can really increase the effectiveness of group sessions if you can get more people to attend and do it in an easy fashion from their home. So the telehealth was designed as an intervention to overcome this. Um, and this was figured out through a pilot study and a lot of early studies that said, you know, we can have greater participation if we make it easier on our patients. And that's how telehealth got inserted into this trial. So um, where does the ATP staff and telemedicine come into play in the study? Well, patients were consented randomized into the, you know, the different arms and so on. And then the ATP staff was there to literally review the technical requirements with the patients. They had access to the computers, laptops, tablets, smartphones, and so on, help the patients set up, help them run through all the different procedures and spent time before any of the group sessions took place, getting the patients used to the technology. When the patients did not have access to technology or internet connectivity, they were offered loans using a signed agreement, or they had uh, 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 access to, or in increased phone access provided to them. Um, and it was prepaid shipping label to ship it out to the patients and then they sent it back. Next slide. There, before every session, there was a test video call with the telemedicine staff. Uh, we use Zoom for all of this, and they ex just made sure everything was still in place before the actual sessions took place. Our help desk was involved to solve network connections, hardware problems, like I said, orient everybody to Zoom. This was patients as well as providers, um, and basically get everybody on board. Uh, you know, people think of Zoom, it's easy. You just push the button, you connect. When you've got a group session going on and you've got multiple participants, you have to explain sometimes, what's the difference between gallery and speaker views? How do you set up your interface so you can have an effective group session? And that's what the, the telemedicine experts were there for and to help. The ATP staff member actually attended all the video conferencing sessions in person at the same location to provide tech support throughout the stations. They were at the same location as the uh, ostomy nurse, the presenters were. And so they were 100% on board. It wasn't like hook everybody up and then they're gone. Next slide. And so there was a lot of data that was connected throughout the trial. Obviously the, the measurements from the patients, the ostomy study for self, the ones that I noted in the beginning, but we also recorded a lot about the actual sessions the prep time for the video conferencing, uh, the session attendance record, the marketing and advertising, the video conferencing prep and setup time, how much direct time was there with the patients before and after the sessions, post-conferencing wrap up, the mentoring time, the number of contacts and so on. But again, how many times was there an intervention with the IT to fix the video at conferencing equipment and so on? And what was the staff time involved to help the participants with the video conferencing setup? These are outcomes and very useful information from an implementation sciences point of view that people really don't think about when they're carrying out trials. And, and the photo down there is Pete Yonsetto. He was uh, like the main person who was involved in these trials from the ATP team who helped the patients and really became a friend to the patients and a vital connection that really made the trial proceed a lot easier than it would have without the dedicated attention to this telemedicine component. Next slide. I'd like to give another example. Um, this is in uh, here at Emory in our interventional radiology team. Now, 
if people seem to think of, you know, teleradiology, yeah, it's been done. We've been doing it for 25, 30 years. You ship the images here, there, the radiologists sit in their little dark dungeons and read the images. That's it. Well, interventional radiology is very different. Uh, our providers interact intimately with patients. They do interventions, they do procedures and so on. Now, prior to COVID-19, our team was working on a lot of solutions uh, to the barriers that were facing our brick and mortar interventional radiology clinics. Uh, we were renting space from other sections, uh, ownership of the clinic, we had some logistics, we were growing very rapidly, there wasn't a lot of space to bring on providers. So they were working on very creative uh, solutions that incorporated telemedicine. Uh, now, if you think about it, most interventional radiology consults, not the procedures themselves, the patient still has to come in to have their procedure done. But most of the consults in IR don't require hands-on physical assessment. Typically, the interventional radiologist will review the image, discuss options with the patients, risks, benefits, and so on. This is ideally suited to telemedicine, and it really allows for team science-based clinical trials. Again, because radiology is incredibly important for a lot of, lot of trials, but cancer trials in specific. Uh, next slide. So, a procedure uh, when you want to uh, do can cancer treatment with interventional radiology or other types of treatments as well, patients are typically referred by other providers. They have their imaging results available. Um, and a lot of times, some procedures can be self-referred. So the patient uh, brings their own images. But once the procedure is completed, that's not the end of the job of the interventional radiologist. Typically, they see the patients along with the imaging three, six, nine months after the procedure. And again, this is where telemedicine can come into play with, with uh, the team aspect of patient care as well as interventional radiology. So you can see these patients afterwards. The patient does not have to come into the interventional radiology clinic. Everything can be done remotely. It helps with patient scheduling, provider scheduling. Interventional radiology is an incredibly busy specialty and they don't have a lot of time. Telemedicine really helps when there's urgent and emergent issues arising with the patient because they can see be, be seen virtually almost immediately um, by our IR team and it really is effective and again for cancer patients not having to travel not having to you know, slog through all the traffic and everything to get to our interventional radiologist for potentially a 15 minute you know look and just tell me what's going on and they can solve it remotely it really helps ensure uh, continuity of care and a lot of the research that we're doing, setting up uh, the IR process, again, a lot of it is implementation sciences, um, but it helps us figure out ways to improve our process overall with telemedicine as, as it kind of filtered over into our real life practice as well. Next slide. Uh, a little bit about adverse events and unintended consequences. You know, I have not read any studies that have reported more or different adverse events uh, with telemedicine than in person, but I don't read every single paper that comes out, so it doesn't mean there haven't been any. Um, but there have been challenges and benefits, and a lot of unintended consequences can actually be good. This is uh, very quickly a study that we did looking at trying to follow patients uh, on their outcomes after teledermatology. Uh, next slide, and we did this a number of years ago, and we found very similar things between the in-person and the telemedicine groups. Um, and, you know, some were good, some were bad. I mean, both had patients lost to follow up. Um, a lot of the records had notes about the telemedicine visit, which was great. Um, but not many of them actually had copy of written reports. Um, so maybe there was a note that telemedicine occurred, but the reports never really got into the EMRs. Um, so, but this was in both groups. In person consults, those notes rarely got into the referring providers' records either. So, um, a lot of things that we have to really pay attention to when we're trying to do uh, research with patients. You know, the unintended consequence that came out of, of this particular investigation was that we figured out that a lot of our referring providers, especially with teledermatology, after a while, they stopped asking for consults, uh, but it wasn't because they were dissatisfied with telemedicine or dissatisfied with the results. Basically, they learned. They learned what a particular diagnosis, you know, they kept sending specific lesions. They kept getting the same answer back. That's actinic keratinosis. Here's how you treat it. They learned 
they no longer had to rely on telemedicine for certain patients. So unintended consequences, but in this case, it was a very positive one. So next slide. Uh, I encourage everyone to look at uh, this paper. It's a blueprint for the conduct of large multi-site trials in telemedicine. It was it just recently came out uh, uh, this year in September. Um, it is from another workshop, um, and it really was an attempt to kind of identify uh, some issues and challenges that people face with multi-site trials, specifically looking at a series of uh, PCORI grant recipients and the challenges they faced with implementing their telemedicine programs or, or research trials. Next slide. So key recommendations in conclusion, you know, clearly telemedicine can enhance clinical trials. It can also be the focus of clinical trials. But I think RFP should encourage the use of telemedicine in any clinical trial. Again, needing to differentiate between telemedicine as a tool to facilitate the trial versus the actual intervention. But in both cases, implementation challenges are very similar. Uh, you've got to plan, operationalize, standardize, support, and train. I think you have to set expectations uh, with all your participants uh, about the participants, the outcomes, data collection, and so on. Um, you know, I think it was important uh, from the previous speaker, non-inferiority versus something better than. Uh, you can't expect telemedicine to cure cancer, basically. Think outside the box. Our IR team really did that when they're trying to do their clinical trials and so on. Look to future technologies. I really think artificial intelligence is going to be a huge impact on telemedicine and healthcare in general. And I think RFPs uh, should encourage the use uh, not only of telemedicine, but artificial intelligence within that context. They should also include mechanisms and funds for the type of stuff that the first study I talked about, for training, for loaners, for longitudinal time points, and for including personnel on the grant that you normally wouldn't think of, like our Pete, who was there throughout all the trials, and his time has to be covered as well because it really does facilitate the trials. Next slide. So thank you very much. And I think we deal with questions later. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Kropinski. We really appreciate you bringing the cancer prevention and control discussion into this rural telehealth workshop. Uh, so next we will welcome Dr. Anna Bastos de Cavallo presenting on methodological weaknesses of studies of provider to provider telehealth in rural patients the example of studies screening for eye disease. So you may Thank begin. You Thank much. you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to talk a little bit about ophthalmology, which I think is not always on everyone's mind when we talk about telemedicine. And a little bit of that is because we are so far behind many other uh, specialties in that we just more recently started using teleophthalmology in the US uh, for patients, and even then it's, it is somewhat limited. And so we still have a long way to go, uh, both clinically and in terms of, of studies um, for teleophthalmology and specifically for rural patients, as you'll see with my presentation. Um, next slide, please. So I have uh, no conflicts of interest other than, you know, I just, my, my research is supported by a grant from the NIH, but other than that, no other conflicts of interest. Next slide, please. Uh, just for a little bit of background, when you when you think about teleophthalmology, provider to provider teleophthalmology, uh, it is done mainly asynchronously. So, which, which means it's done in, in a store and forward manner, where uh, the usually what, what happens is pictures are of of a, a specific uh, part of the eye are taken, uh, and then those pictures are stored and forwarded to an eye care specialist that reviews them and then issues a report. This is done nowadays uh, mostly and almost exclusively for screening of diseases and specifically for diabetic eye disease. And it's being studied also for other diseases such as retinopathy of prematurity, which occurs in prematures, uh, glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration. And, uh, you know, most of these applications are actually still under study. They're not a standard approach and they're not considered uh, clinically approved yet, with the exception of the diabetic eye disease screen, which is which can be done via teleophthalmology and is considered a standard approach. The traditional screening for, for these uh, eye diseases is typically with an in-person dilated eye exam. 
Uh, and that requires a driver. Besides the, 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 pa the patient's lost time, it also requires a driver because patients can't drive after being dilated. And it also requires an eye care specialist, which is a frequently a very difficult access in rural settings. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just for, for those of you who don't really, uh, you know, are not familiar with how a teleophthalmology uh, 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 program works. This is how it works for the, the established programs for diabetic eye screening. So primary care clinics have these uh, cameras that are specialized and that take pictures of the, the back of the eye, of the retina. Uh, and these are operated by local uh, medical assistant or technicians that are actually employees of, of the primary care centers and that are just trained to use these cameras. And then these pictures are, are stored and forwarded through the cloud uh, for remote interpretation by a remote eye care provider. Um, then the, the, the eye care provider then issues uh, an, a report that covers the diagnosis as well as uh, recommendations for follow-up of uh, what was found in, in the exam. Uh, next slide, please. So why, why does rural teleophthalmology actually matter and why should we be, be interested in, in improving access to it and also uh, the quality of evidence that exists around teleophthalmology. So, in a, in a, in a practical perspective for the patient uh, at the point of care, it's similar to to what it is what it happens with other specialties. It's it's of much easier access. It increases compliance and it also reduces financial burden uh, because um, reading of images is in general much more inexpensive than an, an in person eye care uh, eye care provider appointment. It also doesn't require an extra visit because it can be done at, at the point of care and during the primary care appointment. And it doesn't require dilation in the vast majority of patients and therefore it eliminates the need for a driver. Uh, finally, because it can be done immediately in the moment where they're coming for their PCP appointment, there's no wait. Whereas with traditional eye care appointments, patients many times can wait months in rural settings for an eye care appointment. For the PCP, it also has um, several advantages, namely the results are easily accessible, which is something that usually doesn't happen with um, uh, just traditional eye exams, where it's all, sometimes it's impossible to get the report back from the from the, the eye care provider, and therefore the PCP is left without knowing what is going on with the eye health of the patient. Uh, it's also it also makes it easier for the PCP to meet quality metrics goals such as the HEAS goals. Uh, and the PCP doesn't have to worry about requesting or follow up, following up a referral to an eye care provider, which is necessary every year in the case of people with diabetes. Uh, next slide, please. And specifically for di diabetic uh, screening via tele teleophthalmology, it is so important because diabetes is, is the leading cause of blindness in, in the in US adults. And 90% of this blindness can actually be uh, prevented with early detection and treatment. And that early detection can easily be done with these annual uh, pictures via teleophthalmology. It also reduces the costs for patients and health systems and increases qualities. Next slide, please. So where are we at in terms of studies of provider to provider teleophthalmology? Um, there, as I mentioned in the beginning, we we are still at a, at a much earlier phase than other specialties such as cancer, like we like we just heard from the previous speaker. Um, we we currently have evidence that shows that diabetic eye disease uh, screening via telemedicine is an adequate alternative to in-person eye exams, but it is pretty much limited to diabetic eye screening. All the other uh, interventions are still not evidence based, namely for the other diseases that I mentioned before, such as glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration. And even the studies that we currently have on provider to provider rural teleophthalmology in the US are limited to diabetic retinopathy screening. We have no studies on other diseases. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, on the studies we do have on provider to provider uh, telehealth in, in US, even those we have a positive of US rural studies, the vast majority of the ones we have are single center. And so here we're already looking at, at many of the vast methodological weaknesses that we currently have and the gaps that we have in teleophthalmology in rural settings in the US. So the vast majority of the studies we do have are single center. Um, we do not have any robust studies on patient level outcomes or follow up for positive screens. And here you can see how far behind we are compared to 
for example, the previous speaker was talking about um, uh, outcomes on patients and how the uh, RCTs are, are uh, designed to look at outcomes and compare outcomes with, on, with a, a tele-intervention versus a, a standard intervention. We are not even there yet. We're still looking at efficacy and effectiveness of telemedicine uh, as an evidence-based intervention to be to, in terms of sensitivity and specificity and to increase screening rates. But we haven't even gone to the point of looking in uh, determining whether uh, diabetic retinopathy screening via telemedicine, uh, how, how it affects patient level outcomes, for example. And finally, we, we don't have any meta analysis or systematic reviews on the efficacy of teleophthalmology for screening in rural populations, which is a, just a natural conclusion from what I mentioned previously. It's very difficult to do a meta analysis or even a systematic review when there are so few studies. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, next, I'm, I'm going to show show you the basically the, the only studies that currently exist on provider to provider teleophthalmology uh, in U.S. rural populations, and they're all, as I mentioned before, on diabetic eye screening with diabetic retinopathy screening. Next slide, please. So the Jocelyn Vision Network and the studies that came out of this network uh, is the, is the probably the oldest and the largest network of diabetic eye screening via teleophthalmology in the U.S. It, is, it's, it works in the Indian, Indian Health Service and it has 99 centers across the U.S. Most, but not, not all of them are rural. And the, the one uh, bigger study that, that they uh, published uh, was, again, it's a, it was a single site study uh, done on effectiveness of um, diabetic eye screening, uh, where they showed that indeed um, diabetic eye screening could increase screening rates and could also increase treatment um, and is, was also cost, cost effectiveness, uh, cost effective both on uh, detection of diabetic eye disease over the conventional exams and also cost effective on terms of uh, savings for how many more treated patients and how much less severe vision loss existed. So, you know, methodological weaknesses that you can determine here in this in the study, you know, it's a, it's a single site study. So um, it, it, it was it had a small, a small N uh, with uh, not a, a very, uh, not very generalizable because it is a single site and it, it, it was powered enough to show effectiveness, uh, but uh, leaving leaving all all of these other uh, issues in, in, in place, name, namely the fact that, that it wasn't um, uh, an RCT, this was a retrospective study that they, they looked at the data after it had been collected, basically looking at just the patients. Um, after a few years of, of, the, of the network, they looked at this particular site and, and looked at uh, um, how many patients had been screened with, with, with um, uh, telemedicine versus the conventional and how much had been saved. Um, next slide, please. The second group uh, that is working in this area is a group out of Wisconsin led by Yao Lu uh, that pu uh, published a few studies called the EyeSight studies. Uh, most of them are uh, qualitative implementation science studies uh, that looked at barriers and facilitators to telemedicine eye screening via, um, in, in, in one rural clinic in, in Wisconsin and looked also at patient perspectives and identified strategies for implementation of telemedicine diabetic eye screening. And then finally, the, the last study that they recently published, it was a very welcome study because it was the first study to look at um, act the actual develop te development testing and refinement of an implementation package for uh, telemedicine diabetic eye screening in a, in a rural clinic in the US. So, uh, you know, just some more steps here, trying to, to, to assess effectiveness of a particular implementation package, but still not looking at patient outcomes, still just one rural clinic and with a very small N. Next slide, please. Uh, and then the final group of, of, uh, uh, of uh, researchers or uh, um, lab that's looking at, at this issue is, is my own lab. Uh, we, we coordinate the Kentucky Appalachian Eye Network, which we founded in direct. It, it has 44 sites across 22 counties in Kentucky, as you can see here in the map. Next slide, please. And uh, in this uh, uh, network, uh, we looked at uh, the effectiveness of, of telemedicine diabetic eye screening in a subset of our rural clinics. So we look at, looked at six rural clinics over the period of, of uh, six years. And we were able to find that we had a 14% sustained increase in the rates of diabetic eye screening 
um, in our network in, in the subset of rural clinics. And also that the, the, the increase in screening rates was very, it was variable clinic by clinic. And that also that the sustainment in, in, in rates varied from clinic to clinic and could be achieved in some clinics, but in others couldn't. But again, some methodological weaknesses of my own group uh, are that um, al although we did have more than one site, we had six sites, uh, this wasn't a prospective study. This was a retrospective study. Uh, and um, we also still haven't looked, we are now doing that, but it hasn't been published yet, but, but no one has still published any robust studies on follow-up and outcomes of patients who are screened with telemedicine diabetic eye screening versus the conventional screening. Next slide, please. So what are currently the challenges of the facilitators for rural teleophthalmology, both clinical wise and, and also for studies on rural teleophthalmology? Next slide, please. Uh, so we have one, one of the one of the, the the main challenges that we have when we try to conduct these studies or to implement telemedicine uh, eye screening uh, is is that it, it's actually an inner setting issue uh, where there is a significant disruption to to the clinic and to the clinic flow and clinic personnel that happens with these cameras because the burden of doing the screening falls on uh, the clinic and and the clinic personnel. Uh, so it's an additional task that they have to perform besides their their already uh, their already uh, full days. Um, all uh, this is this is also uh, aggravated by the fact that rural clinics in general have a high personnel turnover, and that uh, personnel needs to be trained to not only operate these cameras but also to be in in the in the studies where we are uh, testing. Uh, effectiveness and implementation of, of these technique of these uh, evidence based interventions in therefore in all of this um, uh, works uh, all where it works as as challenges that that augment each other because the disruption to, to clinic flow makes the, the, the work harder per personnel turnover becomes uh, becomes a, a, a barrier also to to conduct the trials and to, to actually conduct the intervention of screening uh, and then having person personnel trained um, and retrained is also an issue when you have a high personnel turnover. There's also issues with, with um, uh, inadequate web connection, which is, a, I think, is an issue for, uh, you know, the majority of, of uh, te tele telemedicine in rural settings where sometimes web connection is, is not easy. And, and for us in particular, it makes it hard for uh, the, the medical assistants to, to transfer the images to, to us. Um, and, and then, you know, until recently, this wasn't considered a responsibility of PCPs, uh, and recently they've had to take this, uh, as their own responsibility in that they, they, now they have the camera in, in their clinic and they have to, uh, um, request and, and make sure that the exam is performed. And so there is some, 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 uh, resistance to this exam and to clinical studies that are uh, trying to be conducted in, in these primary care clinics uh, because, because of this uh, added responsibility for PCPs. Next slide, please. Uh, other, is, other challenges that, that are particularly relevant to, to research in this area uh, are the EMR integration of the reports. So we have different EMRs and the trials that we conduct are real, real set, uh, uh, real world trials. And therefore we have different EMRs in different clinics and different sites. And it becomes difficult to to have an IT solution that's specific for each EMR and that allows integration of reports to each particular EMR. Um, when we are trying to look at uh, outcomes uh, and ascertaining, for example, um, specifically um, effectiveness of telemedicine in increasing screening rates for diabetic eye screening, we have we always have uh, issues for in the studies in. Uh, uh, determining and in, in, in performing EMR queries because the EMR queries don't distinguish what is a traditional eye screening and what is a patient that was screened via telemedicine. They just, the, 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 the code basically just defines that the patient was screened that year, but it doesn't tell us whether it was via telemedicine or via traditional eye screening. So that's one big issue that arises in studies of effectiveness of telemedicine diabetic eye screening. Uh, and finally, uh, we have noticed also that that in our studies there had there had there have been a, a significant decrease in adoption of um, 
uh, specifically teleophthalmology, uh, because these are now considered lower priority exams. And in these rural clinics that are many times strapped for resources, telemedicine diabetic eye screening uh, is postponed or even canceled uh, in favor of other exams that are considered higher priority. Next slide, please. Uh, but we do have some facilitators too that uh, have made it somewhat easy for 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 providers and for clinics to to uh, be interested in enrolling in our trials and in in general for for clinics to adopt this technology. It is a relatively easy technology to learn. The cameras are fairly easy to use. The results are very quick. You can have the results from the reports anywhere from one day to one week. Uh, and there's a frequent rate of positive screens. Up to 20% of our of our images actually show uh, disease that otherwise wouldn't be detected, and, there, and that motivates uh, providers and clinics to be interested in continuing this technology and in collaborating with us in, in clinical trials and in trials of, of implementation. Uh, it also facilitates achievement of quality metrics goals for the PCPs. Uh, and one one big barrier that we had and that is now almost no longer a barrier was that that billing and reimbursement for for the screening exam was very difficult uh and now with covid 19 legislation things became much much easier next slide please so uh currently uh what are the gaps that 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 exist in studies of provider to provider rural teleophthalmology next slide please so we I've mentioned several of these are already, uh, you know, some, some are methodological weaknesses that we already mentioned and others are actually gaps that have never been looked at and, and that we need to start looking at uh, or are already being looked at by, by some of the groups that I mentioned before, including my own, but ha haven't been published yet. So the, the first thing we need to, to actually start doing is uh, to have robust uh, clinical trials that look uh, at the effectiveness of this uh, of this this type of screening uh, in multi sites and that are generalizable and have a large N and um, that uh, will will actually determine whether uh, this type of technology is beneficial in increasing screening rates compared to just the the, the standard standard of care which is to refer to a, an in person eye care provider. Um, there's also no studies on effectiveness of teleophthalmology for other diseases such as glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration. So those just, those just have to be started from scratch and we can start with pilot trials and move on to larger trials. Uh, implementation science uh, trials are also lacking substantially in teleophthalmology and those need to be conducted very soon, namely uh, the clinical trials for, for implementation strategies, including adaptation of programs for, uh, for rural teleophthalmology. And then we need to look at in in these clinical trials or, or the implementation trials. We need to look at um, different how different technologies integrate um, uh, in, into into the studies, and also what strategy strategies we, we can provide to these primary care clinics in terms of IT, IT support, which is very frequently necessary for for uh, this technology to be adopted uh, effectively by providers and by clinics. Um, next slide, please. Um, we, we also don't have any, any uh, trials that look at sustainability of, uh, of, of, of uh, teleophthalmology after grant periods are over. And these, this is a, a well-known problem with, with telemedicine is that sustainability see, uh, tends to wane after, after grants are, grant support is over. Uh, and again, you know, I already mentioned the multi-site longitudinal studies of effectiveness, RCTs. Uh, and very, very important, as I mentioned before, and we really have to move forward and, and go, go in this direction of looking at follow up for positive screens and mainly patient outcomes. What are the outcomes of patients that are being screened um, via telemedicine versus the patients that are being screened with a uh, uh, standard of care in person uh, dilated eye exam? Uh, and finally, also looking at social determinants of health, which are very important in rural settings and how those affect uh, how how and which patients are screened and how they are followed up and the outcomes of patients. Next, next slide, please. Uh, the last gap, big gap that we have, and it's a, a good gap to have, is a gap in studies of AI for diabetic eye disease. And, it's, and when I say it's good, it's because we actually have AI that has already been FDA approved. Previous slide, please. 
uh, we have AI that has been approved that 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 does the readings uh, that that are human independent, so they can, the AI can do the readings for diabetic eye disease with the, the images taken. It is it is supposed to decrease cost and have immediate turnover. So it would be really really relevant to do studies that are going to look at AI solutions and their integration into uh, rural teleophthalmology uh, and how that can, uh, if that increases adoption and sustainment of the programs and how it, how it influences outcomes for patients. And so we actually, my group is actually um, designing a study with AI right now. Next slide, please. And so these are our final key recommendations based on all the gaps and methodological weaknesses that I mentioned. Uh, so we need to conduct studies in effectiveness of telemedicine for diseases other than diabetic retinopathy. Uh, we need to, to conduct large uh, clinical trials that are robust and generalizable, multi-site. Uh, it is very important also to adopt much more implementation science into teleophthalmology and conduct hybrid effectiveness implementation trials that will assess simultaneously the effectiveness of, of, of the evidence-based intervention and the effectiveness of implementation strategies for that particular evidence-based intervention in rural settings. Also, trial AI applications for rural settings, as we just discussed before. And finally, and maybe the most urgent and easier and, and quicker to, to achieve, which is to convene a group of, of experts that includes researchers, clinicians, and patients uh, that can define priorities in research and implementation of rural teleophthalmology uh, so that we can go down, start going down that list and actually finally uh, gathering a robust body of evidence that will indicate where to move forward with teleophthalmology. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Cavallo. That was a great presentation. Good addition to the session. Thank you so much. Uh, so we will now take a 10 minute break. Uh, the countdown timer on the screen will help you track the time remind you when to come back. Uh, even during the break, we're taking questions in the Q&A pod, so feel free to keep um, adding those in. Um, remember to add the presenter's name um, before the question and then send the question to all panelists. And after the break, we will hear from two more speakers and then we'll have a discussion session for key question four. So we still have quite a bit left to go, so we will see you back in 10 minutes. Thank you, everyone. The presenter on the key question for, uh, four. Uh, Dr. Ward, you may begin. Thank you. Thanks. And I think the slides need to go back to the beginning. And so I'm Marsha Ward, uh, professor at the University of Iowa. And as it says, I'm going to focus on provider to provider telehealth that's in rural emergency departments. Next slide. Our funding comes from HRSA's Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. And besides what I'm presenting today, I want to disclose that we have received funding from Avera Health, and I think they're the largest provider of tele-ED services in the U.S. Next slide. So I direct the Rural Telehealth Research Center. We're funded by HRSA's Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. Our charge is to contribute to the evidence base for telehealth, and we have um, investigators at three different universities that uh, are working together on this. Next slide. So why tele-ED? Um, I, I think it's a prime example of provider-to-provider -provider telehealth, although as we're hearing, provider-to-provider uh, -provider telehealth covers a lot of different applications. This one in particular is obviously hospital-based. Um, and why is it important in rural settings? It's because hospitals in rural settings are particularly challenged in terms of workforce, um, I'm in Iowa. I know that um, we have a large number of critical access hospitals, and the average staffing is only five providers, and they are required to staff the emergency department 24-7, seven days a week, um, and so that is a real challenge uh, for those small rural hospitals and those providers in order to cover. So consequently, um, being, access, uh, being able to access a service that connects them through video directly to specialists, um, usually board-certified emergency physicians, other 
um, nurses and other specialists and clinicians at a hub, usually an academic medical center or a large urban hospital, um, really brings in that extra um, members of the team, especially in urgent situations. And so it's a definitely valued service, telehealth service in small rural hospitals. Next slide. So um, we're hearing today about this new systematic review, which I'm so excited to dive into and read. Um, we did conduct one specifically on tele-ED, so much more limited than uh, what the folks have done uh, at the Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center. Um, so when we did this, it was published, but really we stopped looking at studies um, up until 2013. So it's getting rather dated by now. Um, we found 38 studies. Uh, and what was interesting is tele-ED has several different types of services. So there were eight studies um, on minor treatment clinics. And <clears throat> in the U UK, um, they had rolled out minor treatment clinics um, staffed by uh, highly trained specialized nurses, um, it was a model that the National Health Service was using, and they did quite a bit of evaluation of it. Um, so we probably aren't seeing these in the literature anymore. Um, but what we're seeing in the US, Australia, Europe, um, Asia, other places, is kind of two broad buckets of um, tele-ED uh, studies or services. One is what I call the all comers. And so it's a service to uh, the clinicians and the rural EDs uh, to use whenever they feel the need to use it. Um, the other one is specialized, and so telestroke is the most uh, common one that we hear about in terms of a specialized service. Uh, when we looked at the literature, there were some others. Ophthalmology, our last speaker, um, these all came, I think, from Australia, and it was um, eye injuries showing up in a rural clinic and how they were able to do tele. Uh, ophthalmology in that setting. Um, so those were the types of um, conditions where we were looking at the studies. Next slide. So generally what we found was the technology worked, and I'm sure it works even better now. Um, basically, everybody was happy with these services. Uh, these studies tended to show the ones that looked at it that there was reductions in patient transfers. Um, there was less data, I'm working down the list here from uh, high agreement to less agreement, uh, less studies in terms of process and especially outcomes, good agreement on interpretation of x-ray scans, that sort of thing. Um, clinicians express confidence in the advice they received, but when we really get to outcomes, there's limited studies um, and a particularly economic studies, very limited. Next slide. So a colleague of mine put the slide together a couple years ago, um, looking across all of telehealth and um, pointing to most of the studies, as previous speakers have said, um, our single network, single site really um, studies. Uh, and there's some potential for bias in those, um, whether they're you know generalizable to other settings is obviously the biggest question. Um, very few studies that actually had multiple networks involved. So next, next slide, please. So this sets us up to an incredible opportunity that we're given. Um, Tom Morris, who was one of the early speakers on the first day uh, from HRSA's Office for the Advancement of Telehealth. Um, when we were funded, initially funded six years ago, uh, again, with this charge of, of adding to the evidence base, um, HRSA's Office for the Advancement of Telehealth had just funded six networks across the U.S. to provide tele-ED services. And those networks, in fact, were operating in 13 different states and delivering services to 65 rural hospitals. And his idea was to be able to really contribute to the evidence base out of these. Um, and um, so we were able to serve as a data coordinating center. So the next slide. So what we did was talk to these grantees a lot um, and try to figure out how to be able to collect data. 
And the work that we did actually followed up on an earlier project that I collaborated on, which was Mathematica um, Policy um, Center. Uh, did the first stab at identifying data elements and creating a tool to collect this. And then when we were funded, um, we were able to continue this work. So the trick is to find data elements that are already available in these 65 rural hospital emergency departments, um, but that are gonna be useful for answering important research questions. So we settled on 45 of them. We particularly focused on four specific conditions, chest pain, stroke, AMI, and sepsis, because CMS had process, core process and outcome measures related to these, the hospitals were already collecting data. Obviously, these are important conditions in an emergency department. And so we focused in particular on those and then collected other sorts of information. We asked the grantees to submit data over a 26 month period on every tele-ED patient that they saw, and it turned out to be a sample of over 4,000. And then we did a selective um, attempt to get comparison data. Um, so in the same hospitals uh, that had these tele-ED services, but obviously we're not using it for every single patient. We asked them to go back and showed them their patients they submitted data on, asked them to find a similar patient in terms of age, sex, um, the emergency severity in, in index, uh, and within the same hospital, um, in the early, mid, and, and late period. So three, three comparison non-telehealth patients um, to compare to our sample of tele-ED patients. Next slide. So these are the six grantees that were funded during it. And it turned out, um, parallel to what we had found in the literature, that there were basically the two buckets. Just happenstance, it turned out that the top three had the all-comers model of the services they were providing. And then the bottom three all had specialized services. Two of them provided telestroke, one pediatric emergency critical care services, and um, another one behavioral health services. Next slide. So because of what we had seen in the literature of these two different sorts of models, we compared those models for tele-ED services. Um, and one thing we looked at was those places that had the general model, when were they actually using it? And it turned out um, chest pain, cardiac, stroke were still common applications um, when they were actually using, turning on the tele-ED, activating it, connecting to the hub um, to provide assistance with that. We also saw injury, trauma, and mental behavioral health were common in those models. Um, another thing we were able to look at is one of the data elements was when did the patient arrive in the ED? Another one was when did the consult, the provider to provider consult begin? And so comparing that in the general model, it was interesting, third of the time that consult, the tele-ED consult actually happened before the local clinician showed up to uh, the emergency department. Um, and this just speaks to the um, reason why tele-ED is such a valued service in small rural hospitals. Um, think of a winter storm and bad roads and, and a provider that lives you know, outside of town. Um, and for maybe the nurse and technician are the only people in the emergency department at that point. And for them to be able to push a button or, or log on and get this video connection to specialist emergency physicians and nurses and other specialists is valued amazingly. Um, so they uh, activated the service um, quickly. In contrast, the ones that had the specialized service there was much more of a delay um, and not to slam them in any means. What this means is they're protocol driven and they need to work through the protocol often, um, really do some diagnostic work uh, to determine that the patient really is an appropriate patient for that service, um, that it makes sense to activate that service for a consult on that particular patient. So they're not gonna do that right off. It, it's it's gonna take a little bit of time. So. 
this speaks to what some of the previous um, presenters have talked about of different models, different approaches, not all of, even though tele-ED is one form, a specialized form of provider to provider, there's even subsets of it. Um, and we be, need to be mindful of that as we're looking at our studies and doing research on this. Next slide. So we were able to pool data across uh, these six grantees. And we looked at patients that were presenting with, with chest pain. Um, turned out that there was 1,200 patients that presented with chest pain. About a quarter of them, the tele-ED consult was actually activated. And this is very interesting. And this is typical. Um, the service is available in these hospitals, but it's not um, always activated. It's really up to the local clinicians um, to decide whether it's going to be a helpful service to have. Um, and I think uh, previous and presenters talked about the learning effect, and I think that really is playing a role here. Um, if you've already activated it a number of times and you know the hub is going to say, you know, do A, B, and C, um, then you may not decide to activate it on a patient when you know that you need to do A, B, and C. So um, another hidden factor in here is some of these services really helped facilitate the transfer. And so they were activating it because maybe the nurse technician um, before the, the cl um, local clinician, local provider even uh, arrived, were seeing that this was a patient that, that clearly needed to get a transfer. Um, they activate the tele-ED and the hub says, yes, and, and we've got it on the way, we agree. So there's hidden factors going on here in this decision making, and we really, as researchers, need to be mindful of all of that. So anyway, back to some of the findings that we were able to examine. Um, we did find faster diagnoses, faster or higher odds of treatment um, in the patients that had the tele-ED consult compared to similar patients at those same hospitals where it's available but the local providers decided not to activate it. Next slide. We find something similar for sepsis. Um, CMS has a sepsis bundle. Um, it's four components to it. Uh, again, here, look at the really low rates of tele-ED consult, and so it actually, actually being activated. Um, there's some challenges to diagnosis of sepsis in the emergency department. However, in the patients where it was activated, we found out there was higher adherence to the bundle um, and higher adherence to three of four of components of the bundle in the patients that received the tele-ED consult. Next slide. We were also able to look at stroke symptoms across the grantees. So obviously the one grantee that was focusing on pediatric um, isn't contributing data to these, um, but most of the other grantees are. Uh, I think there's one that's behavioral health and, and likewise would not have had um, patients presenting with stroke symptoms, but four of the six did. And so looking at their at those patients, a third of them through the time, uh, there was activation of the tele-ED, higher odds of timely C, um, high timely head CT interpretation, and faster time to uh, administer TPA. The, these results are similar to others because telestroke is luckily one of those applications that's been studied relatively frequently. Next slide. So beyond those sort of pooled um, effects across and, and luckily uh, because of this effort funded by HRSA, um, there was large enough sample size, um, enough power in order with the pooled findings to be able to then um, publish the effects of tele-ED. But we also saw quite a bit of variability. And so, for example, in our telestroke um, pooled, we, we saw effects, but it, they varied across the networks. I think there were four networks in this um, that contributed the data, um, all showing a positive effect, but in some of those networks, it never would have reached statistical significance. It was a rather minor positive effect. Um, so we have to be mindful of this, as other speakers have talked about, um, being able to look at and drill down into uh, these effects. And so coming back to our key questions for this whole workshop, 
you know, number two is what's the effectiveness of provider provider telehealth? Um, obviously, we still need to answer that. Uh, CMS and other funders clearly want to know that. But we also need to move on to this third question, which is what strategies are effective? And I think it's not just strategies, it's what patient populations are effective for, or what particular settings, what type of uh, provider to provider um, consultation service, um, some of the specifics so that we can tease apart uh, who it's most effective for, in what settings, how, what types of services, all of that implementation science has been mentioned before, um, those factors. Next slide, please. So we were asked, charged with, come up with recommendations, and some people um, mentioned this previously. Uh, Dr. Totten talked about their systematic review and this being a factor that they looked at. So. Again, I'm eager to read that and that, that systematic review. I, I'm going to cite it. <laughs> as soon as the final comes out, it's going to be very popular. But as they talked about in tele-ED or emergency services, there was only one randomized trial in the last decade. Um, it's really challenging to do a randomized trial in an emergency department. The other thing that's really challenging in an emergency department with tele-ED services is we would love to be able to examine Medicare or Medicaid claims data, but it doesn't show up in claims. So uh, that makes it very challenging. Um, so consequently, we're left with observational trials and we need a comparison group. So as I mentioned, the approach that we took in this was going back to the hospital saying, okay, here's, here's what you gave us in terms of data for a patient last October around the same time frame. You know, find the, the patient with these characteristics, same sex age, severity um, at your same hospital and please send us their data. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this is an approach uh, that we were able to use for finding a comparison sample, but we really have to be mindful there is bias in the selection of patients where tele-ED is activated, and it's bias based on very good reasons. Um, clinical logic, clinical expertise uh, at the rural hospitals on when that tele-ED activation is going to be most helpful. Um, so just because the patient is the same age, sex, severity, uh, doesn't mean that we've uncovered the really key variables when we're doing a comparison and trying to understand why we're uh, seeing positive results. The patients may have been selected um, in a way that particularly leads to us seeing the positive results. Um, other examples, as Dr. Todd mentioned, you know, pre-post, um, Potential for similar hospitals, which is particularly challenging, um, but may be possible. Um, and so if it was possible doing a difference and difference approach where you have comparison settings and you also have pre and post in, in both your tele-ED and your non-tele-ED groups, um, statistically um, could be helpful, but practically is definitely a challenge. Next slide. Um, so, also general recommendations. So, obviously, as Dr. Totten showed in, in one of the figures, in terms of emergency department, we only have the one randomized trial, the most frequently um, reported uh, study designs are observational studies. And so, uh, random, or I'm sorry, not randomized, observational studies that are prospective um, could be a next strongest um, approach um, but going back to what I said before, not all tele-ED looks the same. Um, and so uh, we, as she also said, it's not disclosed frequently. And Dr. Kropinski mentioned this also. We don't know the details often of what's reported in studies. Um, they talk about telehealth services, but they don't give you the real flavor for what this means. And in a hospital, you know, if we know that they activated the tele-ED, we often don't know from the records what sort of a dialogue there is, what the recommendations are, the action items that come out of activating or not activating. So um, in our observational studies, obviously we, we need to know more. It's hard to collect that data. 
um, but it would be particularly valuable um, to collect more data on usual care interventions in tele-ED. If it's protocol driven, we have, we have more information. Um, but again, that's gonna affect which patients get telehealth, why and when. So we have to be mindful of the factors within telehealth and the way it's being delivered uh, and how those are affecting our studies designs, what we're able to do in terms of study designs and our results. And a final point, um, heterogeneity often can be your friend. So uh, we think of it sometimes as the enemy. We want to look at an overall effectiveness. Uh, we want to get to enough power in order to show that, but really teasing it apart. That's how we're going to an answer that third research question that's posed in this workshop of what are the key strategies? What's, what's um, the key factors that are really helping us to explain our findings? Um, our last slide is just thank you to my team, uh, which has been fabulous in all of this, and I really appreciate this opportunity to present. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Ward, so much for that great presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, okay, so our final presentation or key question four is from Dr. Lori Escher Pines on the topic challenges assessing the importance of telestroke and e consult programs in rural areas. Thank you, Dr. Usher Pines. And don't forget yeah, good, your video. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lori Usher Pines, and I'm a senior policy researcher at RAND. Um, today, I'm going to discuss challenges uh, the teams that I've been involved with um, over the past several years have encountered evaluating provider to provider telehealth programs in rural areas. So, this work um, has primarily been funded by NIH and the California Healthcare Foundation. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about two specific applications of provider to provider telehealth that you've heard a lot about over the past couple of days. Um, so, telestroke and e consults. Um, both of these applications are meant to increase access and improve the quality of care in rural communities. So, I'm going to touch on a national mixed method study um, that our team, led by uh, Dr. Ativ Marotra, uh, has done on telestroke. And then an evaluation of the MAVEN project, um, which is an e consult application. Next slide. Just to start off, I have uh, no conflicts to disclose. Next slide. Okay, so let's get started with telestroke. Um, as you've heard um, throughout the past couple of days, um, with telestroke, remote neurologists use video conferencing to guide local emergency department providers through key decisions, um, including um, administration of TPA uh, and need for patient transfer. There are a variety of models of telestroke, um, but one common one is a stroke expert at an academic hub um, will serve a number of rural spoke sites. So uh, telestroke is pretty common um, in uh, rural emergency departments. In fact, in 2019, prior to the pandemic, um, our study team showed that about a third of all hospitals had telestroke capacity, and that proportion has likely grown um, you know, in the past couple of years, especially as a result of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's great that telestroke is so widespread because research, typically from single uh, hub and spoke networks, you know, have shown that it can improve outcomes. Um, and despite this widespread adoption of telestroke, and evidence uh, that it, it can really impact patient, patient care. Um, when our research team embarked on this work three years ago, there really were very few studies at the national level that incorporated numerous networks and numerous models. Um, and there are a number of reasons for this uh, limited research, uh, which I'll get into. Uh, next slide. So, one big issue to start off with is, you know, if you want to study the effectiveness of telestroke programs and understand, you know, if telestroke is affecting patient outcomes, you need to control for stroke severity um, since higher severity is associated with negative outcomes for patients. If you don't, you really have no way of knowing if a change that you're seeing is a result of the introduction of an effective telestroke program that's working really well or it's because there's a change in the stroke severity um, in the patients that are presenting to the emergency department. Um, so 
A key challenge is, you know, single networks may have this data, may, may have um, the NIH stroke scale for, for patients, um, but it's not usually available um, and consistently in national databases uh, beyond registries. For example, uh, it, it's inconsistently included in Medicare claims data. So, you know, that's one issue and one hurdle to overcome. Second, while researchers representing single networks will know which hospitals they work with, um, there's no really up-to-date comprehensive source on which hospitals in the U.S. have uh, telestroke capacity and which don't. And, you know, this problem is not unique to telestroke. Uh, national inventories on telehealth capacity are really hard to come by across the board. And if if you lack an inventory like this, for example, you, you're not doing annual surveys of um, healthcare organizations. Another option is to look at claims data and to see who has billed for telestroke. Um, if you see a bill, you can confidently assume, right, that um, that the hospital has telestroke capacity. That would make it easy. Um, but as other speakers have pointed out, telestroke consults often don't show up in claims data. Um, we did end up using claims data uh, in many of our studies, but we also independently assembled a list of over a thousand hospitals that we knew had telestroke capacity. Um, and what's interesting is as of the end of 2019, only about 40% of the hospitals with known telestroke capacity had a single bill in Medicare for telestroke. So you see there's this major problem of underbilling um, that, that others have mentioned. But in addition to underbilling, you also find erroneous billing. For example, we've seen many claims um, that are linked to urban hospitals that were not actually eligible for reimbursement you know, prior to the FAST Act in, in 2019. So erroneous billing um, and then inconsistent use of codes, which is, a, which is another issue. You know, these things are not consistently coded. Um, so many difficulties in, in working with claims data. And that makes it difficult to study the impact of telestroke and other provider to provider telehealth services at the national level. So what did our team do? Um, as I mentioned uh, before, we assembled our own database of hospitals with telestroke capacity um, by working with 15 networks and private companies. And we then merged that with claims data. Um, these collaborators that we worked with supplied the names of the hospitals and their networks, as well as the timing of telestroke introduction. So, you know, I have a figure here showing um, that 2014 through 2016 were particularly busy years uh, for telestroke implementation. And I imagine, you know, if we look at 2020 and 2021, you'd see another uh, peak. So, next slide. So. Our team solved this one problem with figuring out who has telestroke capacity, but we faced the additional challenge of trying to figure out if and when telestroke was activated with individual patients. And um, Marsha talked a lot about this issue of activation and how you know, just having the technology and the program in place doesn't mean that you're actually activating it with individual patients that may benefit. So I want to talk a little bit about this concept of assimilation. Um, assimilation is something that's often discussed in the implementation science literature, uh, and it, it's really important here. Assimilation is an innovation's full acceptance, utilization, and institutionalization. In the case of Telestroke, if a program is really assimilated, it means that Telestroke will consistently be activated with patients that could benefit from it. Um, and this slide here shows the opposite of assimilation, right? A fancy cart that's covered in cobwebs, probably locked in a closet somewhere. And, you know, despite the fact that on paper, the hospital has telestroke capacity, um, it's probably not being used enough to have an actual impact on, uh, on patient care. So next slide. So going into this, our team knew that assimilation um, may be a problem as it is with other innovations in healthcare delivery. So we used qualitative approaches to characterize the problem and then identify factors that were associated with better assimilation. Um, hopefully that you know, those could then be spread more widely. Uh, we interviewed 21 spoke EDs uh, in rural communities um, that represented 10 different telestroke networks. And the first thing we did is we asked them, you know, how often are you actually activating telestroke with the patients that could benefit? 
Um, and their answers range from under 5% of the time to almost you know, universally it was used 100% of the time. Um, so, you know, did see this, this you know, interesting variation. Uh, we learned that EDs with poor assimilation had a number of characteristics. Um, in general, in these uh, hospitals, telestroke was perceived to increase complexity and it was felt to be cumbersome. Um, providers didn't feel that it added value beyond a telephone consult. You know, so why go to the trouble of bringing out the cart and, you know, when I can just get a neurologist on the phone and that will suffice. Um, and lastly, we heard that um, often ED providers were comfortable administering TPA without a consult. Um, on the other hand, we heard some interesting things about uh, the characteristics of uh, emergency departments with robust assimilation. And I won't go through all of those today, but um, you know, one thing we heard is that um, telestroke in, is often embedded in broader efforts to improve stroke care. So it's just one component of a broader quality improvement effort. Um, and we heard that telestroke workflow was highly protocolized. Uh, we also heard that um, stroke coordinators would give feedback to individual clinicians about their use of telestroke. Uh, and if um, they weren't activating it as much as other providers, you know, they would, uh, that would be acknowledged uh, by, by staff members. Next slide. So, because our team knew assimilation was an issue, and claims data really couldn't be used to identify which particular patients received a telestroke consult, we decided to just assume that everyone um, who was in a telestroke hospital and um, presented with suspect stroke, we assumed uh, you know, that they uh, were exposed to telestroke. And that's an intent to treat analysis. So you show up to an ED with telestroke capacity, you received you know, telestroke. This makes for a nice conservative study design for studying the effectiveness of telestroke. Um, but this design likely underestimates the effect of telestroke at the patient level because we're giving credit in cases where, um, in some cases where patients didn't actually receive a telestroke consult. The ideal study would get a different data source other than claims to more precisely measure which patients were exposed to telestroke versus you know, which were not. Uh, for example, numerous consulting neurologists would provide data on the consults that they actually completed. Next slide. Okay, so I'd like to uh, share a couple recommendations here, and then I have one also towards the end. Um, the first recommendation is to encourage more consistent billing of telehealth so that claims databases can be better sources of data for studies on telehealth utilization and quality. Um, and this would make our lives easier when studying telestroke for sure, um, but it also has broader implications for telehealth in general. You know, something that I'm worried about right now is we really don't know how many visits, um, telehealth visits that have occurred in the pandemic have been via audio only versus video uh, because of inconsistent coding and, uh, you know, all those issues that I mentioned. And that's a barrier to making good policy, right? Because we don't really know much about um, the quality of audio only visits as a result when you can't tease them out. Uh, a second recommendation then is to conduct an annual inventory of telehealth capacity and volume um, in rural healthcare organizations. You know, this uh, recommendation specifically calls out US hospitals, but this could be much broader, you know, skilled nursing facilities, health centers. You know, we really don't have a great sense of um, who has telehealth capacity and, and the volume and the different models that are, um, that, that are being implemented. Next slide. Okay, so I'd like to shift to e-consults um, at this point. Um, it's a well-known problem that rural patients have fewer visits with specialists. Um, and although primary care providers can refer patients to specialists, many factors um, such as uh, cost, insurance, travel distance, wait times, you know, all of these can be, be barriers uh, to timely receipt of care. And e-consults um, offers one potential solution to increase access. Uh, and these are clinical consultations between primary care providers and specialists um, where information is exchanged electronically and asynchronously. Um, and you know, the goal of many of these programs is to prevent uh, an unnecessary in-person visit uh, with, a, with a specialist and handle more complex cases within the setting of primary care. 
So, you know, these programs have a number of benefits, and I'll talk about that uh, in, in, a, in a couple slides. Uh, but I want to talk about one particular um, uh, project that uses e-consults, and that's the MAVEN project. The MAVEN project started in 2015, you know, recognizing these barriers to timely uh, uh, visits with specialists in rural communities and um, among low-income patients. And what MAVEN did is it recruited volunteer physicians, including retired and semi-retired physicians, um, to serve safety net settings uh, like federally qualified health centers and free clinics. And although MAVEN offered a variety of telehealth modalities when it was first getting started, it has since evolved into a primarily e-consult and ECHO model. Next slide. So here are a few more details on the MAVEN project's model. Um, volunteer specialists support safety net settings through virtual mentoring, e-consults, and education sessions. Um, and by doing this, they support local providers in managing uh, individual cases, as well as just increasing the capacity of PCPs to handle more complex cases in primary care um, without a referral. So um, just increasing the capacity of, of the uh, providers themselves to, to handle complex patients. Next slide. Uh, this slide includes some details on the most common specialties within the MAVEN project. And as you can see, uh, dermatology, endocrinology, and hematology are some of the highest volume uh, specialties. Next slide. So several years ago, um, uh, my team at RAND conducted a mixed methods evaluation of the MAVEN project pilot. And we observed a variety of impacts that were difficult to quantify. Um, in interviews, for example, we learned that remotely located specialists um, were able to decrease their wait times, um, and we heard that often um, remotely located specialists were able, able to provide uh, needed reassurance to patients. And I, I'd like to draw your attention to quote two here. I, a volunteer rheumatologist, have made people feel better about their situations. For example, there are many false positives for lupus. Um, and I have told patients that they don't have lupus. When people are worried about their health, I can reassure them that something is not happening. And so, you know, quote two is a really nice example of something that's extremely important, yet extremely difficult to measure using EHR claims or survey data. You know, when a remote specialist can reassure a patient that something concerning is not happening, right? We're, we're gonna have difficulty picking up on these sorts of impacts. Next slide. One key reason um, that e-consult programs can be challenging to study is that they often try to achieve multiple goals. As such, it's unclear, you know, which outcomes to evaluate. And then, you know, once you have actually honed in on a few outcomes that are really key, it's difficult to ensure that you have the data uh, to actually measure those outcomes, you know, the ones that you have prioritized. Um, and when we set out to evaluate the MAVEN project, we heard about all of the goals um, on this slide. I'll, I'll uh, you know, share a couple right now, but there are a lot of goals. You know, reduce wait times to a specialist consultation of any kind, right, either in person or via telehealth. Um, reduce total costs in anticipation of value-based care models. Provide educational opportunities for on-site staff. So, you know, these programs really are ambitious and are trying to, to do many things. Next slide. So once you have honed in on the few outcomes that you are interested in, you realize that, you know, although you may have the data to explore the impact of the program on the individual study sites that are, you know, implementing e-consults, for example, the primary care provider offices, you may have trouble documenting the wider healthcare system impacts. Um, for example, how the introduction of an e-consult program um, in one clinic is going to impact the number and proportion of unnecessary in-person visits in the offices of local specialists. So many studies do a really good job of um, looking at columns one through three. However, telehealth has systems-wide impacts with multiple data sources. Um, uh, well, sorry, telehealth has, has many systems-wide impacts, and you're not really going to be able to get at this final column wait times for local specialists, no-shows and in-person specialists, proportion of unnecessary in-person visits at local specialists, you really won't be able to get those 
um, uh, without partnering uh, and getting a broader systems perspective because they just won't be visible to evaluators. Next slide. So, a key goal here is, you know, a recommendation is when funding new programs, encourage and incentivize reporting by broader system stakeholders. For example, consider partnering with Medicaid um, and local health plans to make sure that you get the bigger picture and you're not just getting some of the process measures um, that uh, you can see uh, in the primary care provider uh, settings that are implementing the program. Okay, ne next slide. Just a few more methods challenges um, before I wrap up. Um, I'd let, first like to point out that uh, these programs, um, like many telehealth innovations, can be costly and labor intensive uh, to implement. For example, e consult programs require some changes to clinic workflow. They require that staff be trained and then retrained if changes are made. Um, so, how do we really know that the effort is worth it, especially because there's limited capacity for delivery changes in safety net settings? And this is especially um, important right now with COVID-19 and burnout and workforce shortages, there, there just can be a limited appetite for delivery changes. How do we know that an e-consult program is not replacing a different program that could ultimately be more impactful? Um, another interesting challenge is something that's been brought up by prior speakers, so I, I won't go too into depth on this, but it can be really difficult to interpret process measures, like the number of e-consult um, the, the number of consults occurring over time. I can think of both a positive and a negative story to tell about this, you know, if you see e-consult volume decreasing. It could be that um, PCPs hate the program and it's cumbersome and they don't like it and they are going to stop using it. On the other hand, it could mean that the program is extremely successful and um, primary care providers now feel empowered to handle cases without a referral. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it could mean that the, the program is extremely um, successful because it's now proving itself irrelevant over time. Next slide. Um, and then there's also this issue of unintended consequences and others have talked about um, the difficulties in capturing this. Even if a program looks really successful on the surface, um, for example, many cases are resolved without a face to face with a specialist. They could be having a negative impact on key factors like PCP burnout. Some PCPs, frankly, don't like e consult programs because they're tasked with the extra responsibility of managing a complex patient who, in the past, they could just refer out. Um, so, if you ask a PCP, how's this program going? How is it working? They might tell you about how the technology is working, um, if the specialist is responsive and friendly, but you may not capture some of these important underlying frustrations with the model that could impact burnout and ultimately retention. And one you know, last thing to keep in mind, when you successfully avoid a specialist visit, which you know, is the ultimate goal of many of these programs, um, it means that the patient has no opportunity to interact with a specialist for issues beyond the reason for the initial consult. For example, if a patient goes to a dermatologist for a concerning mole, the dermatologist will look at the mole, um, but they're also likely to do a full body skin examination and perhaps pick up on things that neither the PCP nor the patient you know, knew uh, could be concerning. So it's really difficult to assess what is truly lost big picture um, when a visit is prevented. Next slide. So, you know, in summary, the variety, there are a variety of challenges in studying provider to provider rural telehealth. Um, but despite these challenges, there's a lot of great work going on in this area and the pandemic has opened up yet more opportunities for research. Um, and you know, part of that is that telehealth has gotten a big push as a result of the pandemic. And now uh, we're just, we have more examples and um, we're, we're likely to be powered to, to, to look at this uh, um, with more studies. So I'm looking forward to seeing all the innovation that the public health emergency has encouraged and continuing um, to improve on telehealth programs through rigorous research and evaluation. Thanks so much for having me today and, and uh, eager to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Usher Pines. We've really had five great presentations with this key question in this session. So thanks to all of you.
Uh, now we invite all of our speakers from Key Question 4 to join, uh, turn on your video and join Dr. Wakefield for a discussion. Um, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Wakefield. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Karen. And uh, let, let me just say, or Kate, rather, and let me just add my thanks to all of the speakers. This was a terrific uh, set of um, comments from all of you, and I'm sure will generate a fair amount of uh, uh, comment from the panelists, uh, as well as from the audience. The, uh, and, and I would just say before I turn to two of my colleagues to uh, offer their questions and uh, observations, Sarah and Jayashri, I, I would say a couple of things. One, um, clearly one of the themes that keeps coming up is the challenge we have around uh, um, the lack of consistent billing and that as a resource for uh, collecting data to better understand uh, what's going on in this space. So um, that's it was mentioned by this panel. It's been mentioned uh, uh, by uh, other speakers uh, earlier as well. And um, uh, also what has come up earlier previous, in previous presentations, but has come up here again, has been uh, the, uh, a lack of information about any harm, so research areas that um, the research that might be uh, undertaken, uh, um, focusing on you know, strengths, value add, et cetera, but without paying uh, attention to any potential harm that could be caused. You you did speak at the very end, uh, uh, Lori, to you know to some of the potential downsides and uh, opportunities missed, for example, by specialists. Uh, but but again, that's another theme. Uh, this this uh, sense of, of research areas uh, that might um, that maybe we should be thinking about that could lift up any potential adverse uh, impacts of uh, uh, provider to provider uh, uh, telehealth consultations. So um, so again, this panel extending some of the um, issues that have been flagged earlier, and then also introducing a number of new. Uh, features in this discussion about uh, methodological weaknesses of studies, as well as um, you know, how should we approach thinking about improvements that could be made uh, to get even better data to inform policy practice uh, and so on. So with that, uh, Sarah and Jayashri, I'm going to ask either one of you first before I turn to my other colleagues, uh, whether you have any questions and as always will um, uh, I'll be trying to track in the from the Q and A uh, from the audience on any questions they have, and as I see them, I'll try to insert them in this conversation. So, Sarah Jashri. Hi, uh, thank you so much to the presenters. These were great presentations, and it was really interesting to see the diversity of topics and diversity of methodologies and the progression from kind of a broad overview to really specific uh, case studies that, that show all of the challenges we face. So I'd like to ask kind of a broad question about methodology, and it goes back to the first presentation and the pyramid diagram that was shown with randomized control uh, studies at the top and case studies at the bottom. And I guess looking at this field and looking at the diversity of telehealth and implementations and so on, my concern about RCTs is really that many RCTs are essentially also case studies. They focus on a specific technology in a specific setting with specific actors. And so given that, is there scope for other kinds of methodologies, including qualitative and so on? So. Um, and, you know, cross sectional and before, after, and so on. So, just wondering your thoughts about that. Um, this is Annette. I can answer because I put the pyramid up, but I think maybe I should have been clearer. Um, I was trying to say that this is 
the pyramid and the idea that RCTs control bias is an important one to consider for internal validity for comparisons. Um, when I teach research methods, you know, if everything's you know, everything's a nail if you have a hammer. Um, the, the research designs need to match the questions. So you're not going to do RCTs on certain types of questions where a qualitative method is more important. The issue is that if you're going to do, say, before after studies, you need to at least acknowledge the biases that are inherent in looking at mortality before you do remote ICU and mortality after remote ICU. If things, if there's a history effect, things like a pandemic happened in the middle there, or that you only have one point in time, so you don't know what the trend was before. So all study designs, I would argue, could be made more rigorous and should be tailored to the question and to the most important biases that you're worried about is, is sort of what I think the important message is. And, um, I, I think when we say case study, we mean where there's no comparison, where it's, you know, case studies tend to be descriptions, which may be useful for implementation, but are not very helpful for effectiveness. So again, it's about the design matching the question. Does that help? Uh, I'm wondering if any of the other presenters have thoughts also. If I can jump in here, um, we heard the first day, I, I, I paid particular attention, the idea that provider to provider consultations, it's a relationship and it's built on trust. And when we see that the equipment's available, the connection is available, but it's used or not used, um, Qualitative work is very important for finding out some of the whys. Uh, so while this systematic review was focusing on, on patient outcomes, um, there is a lot of research looking at qualitative research that I think is incredibly valuable. But I think that relationship and, and what I'm particularly concerned about, we all know the pyramid, we know about randomized trials at the top of the pyramid, but if telehealth services are really a relationship and based on building trust, it takes time to do that. And if you're randomizing new adopters, uh, their experience with it, their uptake of it, often we see low uptake or we see very selective uptake by those new users. And I think it takes several years for a service provider, the maturity of the relationships until you get a stable uh, use and you convince maybe some of those later adopters that there's some value in this, at least for some of their patients. So I think there's, there's the whole, everything we've learned about methodology and everything, but how do we take those lessons that we've learned and apply them to a re studying a relationship? And so I think you've hit on it. I, I like the tone of your question. And, and just to follow up on that is, you know, two of the things that I mentioned, one is, you know, training, 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 because that helps build that relationship and put the people who are participating at ease. So when they do actually get to the point of having a patient there in person and doing that, they're, they're at least knowing what they're doing. Um, but then the second one is the pilot study. And I, I think people ignore or don't acknowledge the value of pilot studies, whether it's just to get that initial idea of you know, sample size and power analysis, but also just to, to work out the kinks and to identify there's, wow, this is what we did. Gee, that's a huge potential source for confounding and bias later on. Let's think about how we you know, get around that now, rather than, oh, we've collected data on 50 patients and ooh, it looks like something's wrong. Um, you know, so I think that it's the pre part of doing studies, no matter what the design is, that really leads to the success of the actual trial. Yeah, and I, I would add too that um, we can really improve on RCTs. Um, you know, we often try to do pragmatic RCTs that mirror real life conditions as much as possible. You know, you don't have many exclusion criteria, for example. Um, and Elizabeth talked a little bit about using telemedicine as a tool 
in, uh, in RCTs to make RCTs, for example, more accessible. So that's another thing, you know, when we have an RCT where we're relying on a local study site for recruitment, you're excluding a lot of people who could benefit and may be interested in research and telehealth is one way to, um, in other digital, um, you know, interventions and trials are, you know, a way to bring more people in and have the uh, sample be more representative of the patient population. So there's a lot of opportunity there to improve RCTs. I, I'd also, I would also add just a note on the hybrid effectiveness implementation trials that I mentioned in my presentation and that I think are actually a really good way of combining these two things. We have the effectiveness and the patient outcomes on one side, and we have the, the implementation science side of, of where we're looking at relationship relations with, pati uh, with patients, with providers. We're looking at the qualitative side of it. And not only are these trials assessing both, both sides, but they're also advancing uh, evidence faster and getting evidence-based uh, interventions faster into, into clinics. So those are, I think, a really good solution to get, get those two components that are so important for implementation of, of uh, telemedicine into practice quickly. And I like the focus on the implementation sciences, because if you can do that within the context of the clinical trial and figure out, you know, what works uh, as a representative from the telehealth resource centers, you know, the HRSA funded ones, that's the questions we get is how do we do this? They don't care about clinical trials. They don't care about anything. They just, how on earth do we do this? Give us some SOPs. And we're like, Okay, well, I wish we could for every situation, but that's the kind of stuff that implementation sciences can give and say, okay, here's a generic SOP that works in this situation. At least here's a starting point for people. Great observations. Uh, uh, thank you to each of you uh, because you've all added in uh, really important and somewhat different perspectives. Sarah, do you have follow up questions or comments? No, I'll let Jayashri take over. Thank you so much. Jayashri, if you're on, you might be on mute. Mary and Sarah for uh, wonderful, you know, questions and uh, deliberations here. And thanks to the panel of presenters, you all we were really worried at the beginning as to what kind of uh, topics we would be, you know, writing about in terms of the strengths and weaknesses of the different uh, study designs. Uh, but you all have brought in a very real world perspective based on your presentation. So I just want to uh, thank all of you all for that. So in listening to all your presentations, what I understand from Dr. Kripinski is that uh, conceptualization and planning is important. Uh, I'm just trying to summarize, and then the second is uh, from Dr. Carvalho, uh, implementation sciences and planning the effectiveness and patient outcomes and provider outcomes uh, is important. And from uh, whom am I missing? And uh, the last presenter, Dr. Usher Pines, you had actually brought in the health system perspective of assessment. Uh, where you talked about uh, improving the study design in some ways to uh, kind of actually look at uh, mixed methodologies for evaluating provider and patient outcomes. And then, of course, uh, Dr. Ward, you know, uh, you had brought in a fantastic perspective where you had mentioned that probably um, observational studies would, would, would actually be more feasible considering the small sample size in the rural uh, settings. Um, so my, uh, my question is, uh, in moving the field forward, what would be uh, some, of, uh, some of your other thoughts on um, improve, improvement in the study design or planning other than you know, what we have discussed so far? I know that's a broad question. I think from my perspective, in terms of the planning, you know, a lot of the times, you know, you're kind of hoping that it applies to everybody, but yes. sort of those, I think during the planning, you also have to think about the later on, which is the, you know, sort of the, how do you get it out there and which aspects of the study do you want to get out to whom? Uh, you know, everybody wants to publish in JAMA and New England Journal, but you know, maybe those aren't the right places to publish. Um, you know, is it is it perhaps in the telemedicine journals? You know, who? How do we reach 
the people in the trenches really. You know, we did a survey actually recently within within our TRCs, thinking about who are going to be the the shakers and movers in the future with telemedicine. In the past, it used to always be academic medical centers. They were at the forefront. They were doing the research. They were implementing programs, and now they were at the bottom of the list. It's it's not them anymore. So it's the people out there in the trenches. So how do we get all this information out to them? Rather, you know, is it just part of the CME courses that people typically log into when they, you know, yeah. need to, to get their CME? Um, but are there more effective ways to disseminate all this information to people who really need to do it to, to create the hybrid systems of the future that we keep touting? Thanks, Dr. Kupinski. The, the other question is for uh, Laurie. Uh, Laurie usher spines you had talked about you know data repositories and networks and uh, mixed methods so would is that the uh, improvements you would suggest in study designs for the future telehealth uh, evaluations yeah I, I had mentioned this but you know we found it frustrating that there mm -hmm. really isn't a great inventory of who has telehealth capacity um yes these these inventories exist in you know, limited pockets. For example, SAMHSA has a um, has an inventory on you know who has uh, which um, facilities for opioid use disorder, for example, um, have telemedicine. But like it, this isn't a like universal that it's always easy to tap into an, an, an inventory like that. And I, I think that that would really um, help people doing research in this field. And we we talked about this in uh, prior days that it can be very difficult to really define what provider to provider telemedicine is. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of work in safety net settings and prior to the mm -hmm. pandemic, a common model was a federally qualified health center hosting a patient who then would receive care from a um, remotely located specialist, but the FQHC would host the patient. What's tricky is that seems like patient to provider telemedicine, but often local staff would have to sit in on that entire visit for the uh, federally qualified health center to get the PPS rate or get reimbursed for that visit. So is that mm -hmm. provider to provider? Is it provider to patient? Right? It, it, it's it's difficult to um, always tease out what these different models are. And I think you know going forward, we talked a little bit about the need to assess what's working in the context of hybrid care. We also need to, um, you know, understand that some of these models aren't discrete. Um, so just more complexity to, to deal with in research methods. Thank you. And, and, you know, you were talking about more about the access. I think all the panelists were talking about access to telehealth as a 1st step, but I think there is also an opportunity to evaluate the quality of telehealth care. Which is offered in the models, and that's where the unintended consequences, which uh, I think Dr. Kupinski had mentioned, and uh, some of you all had mentioned about uh, what could be the unintended consequences. So those are things which I think uh, one could plan in the and plan in advance in the study designs. Is that is that what y'all are y'all I mean y'all intended to say is my question. I was kind of Thank following you. up also on the databases and stuff. I mean, you yes. know, I don't want to go down the route of, uh, you know, saying we need a universal healthcare uh, ID for everyone, or that we need to have electronic health records that all communicate with each other. But boy, some of these things would be really nice uh, in yes. terms of healthcare in general, but also telemedicine. You know, in, in on the research side as well as the implementation side. I mean, simply having EHRs that can talk to each other. Where the metadata lines up uh, and then connects with REDCap and all these other systems, uh, it you know it, it's it's absolutely necessary. And I you know I, I see some people addressing it, but I really don't see a whole lot of progress. To be perfectly honest, um, in having the ability to transfer and access data from wherever you are, and no matter who your provider is, but that in itself would really help with clinical trials, as well as just the, the practical implementation of telemedicine. Do, do you see any future for having registries, to, you know, patient registries where, you know, patients are or getting like telehealth? like a Google Vault type thing? <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, I came and went. I think in the future, it, it's going to be easier. I think there were some attempts out there, maybe a little bit ahead of their time. Um, yes. You know, as, as patients experience what telehealth is during the pandemic, 
uh, and, mm -hmm. and observe some of their own frustrations and ability to access data. I think, you know, we're going to have more of a, a grassroots effort. And I honestly see within the next five years that that's going to have a little bit of a resurgence again. You combine that with artificial intelligence and some of yes. the tools that are using to uh, deal with big data. I, yeah, I, I actually do see that on the horizon. Thank you. Any other observations to Jayashri's questions from uh, panelists before we open this up to the uh, uh, to our other colleagues to ask questions or make comments? Any other observations? I think on our wish list often is large data sets. And as Lori mentioned, it would just be lovely if we could go into claims database, but as people talked on the first day, the incentives are not there to for reimbursement, so co consequently, um, why even put down a code uh, when you're not going to be reimbursed for it? So, big wish list would be, you know, funding of something that would move forward with a national database, as Lori also mentioned. We don't know who's actually got telehealth systems, and that's a huge challenge. The American um, Hospital Association does an annual survey. But their set of questions are quite limited and who is actually filling out the survey, uh, whether they know the implications of responding, whether they have a telehealth service or not. So that's questionable and in, in terms of using that, and that's really pretty much all that exists. And so yes. we're really hamstrung in the types of research approaches that we can use at this point. And consequently, we're back to the healthcare setting and what can the healthcare setting do. Um, so in terms of health services research to move beyond that, big wish list would be large and, and capability. Yeah, and maybe a national database. I mean, that's the biggest wish list, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, okay. Thank you to the board. The, uh, let's, th th thanks, Jayashri. Let's go ahead and see uh, whether there are comments, questions from our other colleagues on our panel. And if anyone is pitching a question right now or an observation, you might be on mute. There was a comment in the chat um, about implementation frameworks, and I do think that fits in with some of the other comments we've been making in that, you know, it isn't sufficient to know if something works, you have to know how to do it. On the other hand, people will flip that and say, you don't want to know how to do something that doesn't have a positive effect. And that's where the hybrid designs, I think, are very useful. And they mentioned some specific, the comment in the chat mentioned specific implementation um, frameworks, which are very useful because that was sort of our experience in looking at how people talk about barriers and facilitators. They use very different terms, so it's hard to summarize. And that's what these frameworks do is they help you sort of summarize the experience across different places. Um, and then I guess in addition to, I think it was hinted at, but pragmatic trials uh, is an important area to keep an eye on and think about how we could do that, how to make trials more useful. And we mentioned diversity of patients, but also diversity of settings. Um, and that's been something we've been thinking a lot about in our other projects is how to make sure we don't have just set um, practices that are part of like integrated health networks or, you know, just urban practices. Like I said it was interesting to me in the prior review that almost all the remote ICU evaluations were in urban settings and not necessarily where a place that we would assume they would be most useful. Mary, this is Joanne Conroy. Mm -hmm. I'm actually um, on the board of the AHA. And a couple observations, it could be a recommendation that we work with partners to um, develop these data sets or survey instruments in order to broadly benefit the field, number one. Um, number two, I have to assure people that um, hospitals do pay a lot of attention to the AHA database because it is the um, database that's used in U.S. News and World Report for many of the elements as they evaluate best hospitals. So hospitals have a vested um, 
um, interest in making sure that their data is accurate, although arguably you never know who's filling, filling it out. And I, I just wanted to um, bring the answer to the question I contacted the AHA yesterday about how many um, critical access hospitals or rural hospitals are within health systems, larger health systems. And it's interesting, it's only 51%. It varies a little bit um, across the country, but there are still a number of rural facilities that actually are not connected to a health system. So um, everything we talk about, it, it might be a different challenge in an organization that's got that system infrastructure. Thanks, Joanne. That's really helpful information to have, and it certainly speaks to how deliberate uh, uh, researchers need to be in terms of of um, not generalizing across uh, a, a category type, for example, um, or some of the challenges that can be associated with trying to uh, identify impact of, of telehealth facilitated provider to provider communication in freestanding uh, independent uh, facilities versus those that are part of larger systems. In an earlier point in this conversation, just a few minutes ago, I was I was thinking, who's left out if you're if you're um, uh, gravitating to places you can get data, which might be uh, a large system. It could be an a Vera that's tied uh, to um, multi-state uh, uh, hospitals in, uh, across a number of states. It could be the Veterans Health Administration. But who's left out? And what do we need to know about those other uh, facilities, both in terms of their need uh, for this type of access to expertise, and also um, the characteristics of how the this technology and that provider to provider interface might play differently. Uh, so. All by way of saying it, it just adds, I think, to the complexity of um, uh, of all of the dimensions uh, that have surfaced during the course of these three days, and in terms of studying them, isolating uh, impact, whether that's on cost, finance, uh, or access, uh, for example, uh, whether it's impact on on patients, providers, or populations. There's just a lot of different uh, dynamics and and um, moving parts for sure. Uh, let me just ask colleagues again on the panel if there are other comments uh, from any of my colleagues or questions for the speakers. Uh, Mary, I, I would just like to make a comment. This is Anna Bastos. Uh, I, I have not noticed that that uh, question on the chat about uh, implementation science frameworks, but uh, now that uh, Annette mentioned it, I, I went and read, and I just wanted to to uh, just address it just a little bit more uh, to, to maybe respond a little bit better to what Stanley Zeffler uh, asked. So, um, specifically in, in the studies that I showed, um, a couple of the studies that I showed did use implementation science frameworks, namely the, all the studies that are conducted from my lab. We use uh, uh, at least one implementation science framework. Uh, as the background of all of our research, uh, in 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 the ones that I showed, we we use the CIFR framework, the uh, consolidated framework for implementation research, in all of those studies. Uh, that is a framework that is uh, what Annette was referring to as as um, a framework that is uh, basically is able to silo or categorize barriers and facilitators to a particular evidence based intervention. Into into certain categories, inner setting, outer setting, process intervention, etc., uh, and so that that is used mostly uh, in, or more commonly in the in the uh, initial part of of implementation science studies, where we're looking at barriers and facilitators and trying to define implementation strategies. And then uh, there are other frameworks that are actually that actually have slightly or, or very different. Uh, uh, purposes to it, such as the REAIM framework, which is probably the most used framework in implementation science and that we are currently using in our studies too. Uh, and that is actually an evaluation framework that is used to evaluate um, the, the results or the, the, you know, the effectiveness and um, um, adoption, et cetera, of, of the, the intervention or the implementation uh, strategy for the intervention. In particular studies, so um, just you know, the, uh, Stanley was asking specifically about those, and and I know that that uh, my my group uses those quite a bit, and I think that it, they are essential to use if you're trying to do implementation science work or qualitative work, so that it's reproducible and so that you're actually uh, uh, also contributing to the to the body of work in implementation science and contributing to to a broader knowledge on, on general barriers and facilitators to telemedicine. 
Um, and, and so that, that, that particular group of, of evaluation frameworks is really relevant to this more end side of, 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 of studies where you're already evaluating the, the, the effectiveness and, and, the, and the, the adoption and, and, and other things of, of the interventions themselves past identifying and classifying barriers and facilitators. That was a really robust response uh, to his uh, comment. Thank you for that. Let me, though, ask if there are any of the other panelists or speakers, rather, that would like to weigh in on this issue as well. Yeah, I'd like to take it just in a slightly different direction, though, is, you know, a lot of implementation sciences frameworks can be applied to the educational setting. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk and efforts going on about how do we implement telehealth training into the curriculum? And AAMC recently came out with their competencies. Uh, they're currently looking at, you know, different types of curriculum. And it's one thing to just put those curriculum in place, um, but it's a huge opportunity for implementation sciences as well, because you've got your, you know, does everybody pass their boards? Okay, yeah, that's great. And that's one metric of whether your program is good, but assessing it all along and looking at how do we teach telehealth practice to our future providers and what are the best practices there? I think that's a huge, huge area as well that we need to really think about. And it can't just be, you know, in our medical schools, it's the osteopaths, it's the nursing schools, it's all of our allied professionals is how do we best implement telehealth training and assess its effectiveness and how well do they then take those practices and implement them later on once they're in practice, because that's the future. You know, the old fogies who are out there know that quickly picked it up during COVID, that's great, but you know, they're gonna be retiring in 10 years. We need to really get on board with the ones who are, who are coming up and, and they're gonna be providing in the next 10 years. Thanks, Elizabeth. Any other comments on this one? Then let me go back. I am not seeing other questions in the chat unless I'm missing it, in which case if I am, uh, and that looks like you've got a good beat on these. So please feel free if you're seeing something that I'm missing to add in uh, in terms of questions, but also for again, last uh, time through for my colleagues on the panel. Are there any questions or observations from any of you? I just wanted to add 1 thing about the AHA survey. Um, I recently reviewed that, and I, I think I looked at the 2019 instrument, and I think that, it, that you know it's a great start, but there's a lot of additional detail I think that we would need if we were going to go down this route of doing an, in, an inventory of telehealth capacity um, in healthcare organizations. You know, just to give the example of Telstroke, um, if you just hear, yes, this hospital has Telstroke capacity, that doesn't give you all this nuanced information. You know, are they delivering Telestroke? Are they receiving Telestroke? In some cases, they're both delivering and receiving Telestroke. Like a hub may be serving spoke sites, so delivering it, but they may also allow neurologists to go home at night and continue to serve their own emergency department. And so it, it's just being used within systems. So it gets really, really complicated. And I think that there are a lot of surveys that are doing a great job of kind of scratching the surface of this. For example, the NIDI survey. Um, but it's that level down, really getting at models and volume. Um, th that's that's where we're not really getting, I think, the detail that we need. So some core information, Laurie, but you've just identified a number of areas that would be uh, that would provide a richer uh, foundation to pivot from. It sounds like. Uh, also, one of the questions or comments in the chat is uh, is this. In case anyone would like to take it. Um, an observation that uh, it seems for some clinicians on the other end of the line, which I assume by that they mean the the, the specialist being consulted, uh, that there's a problem in getting a clinician on the that end of the line. They don't have time. They uh, there's uh, resistance to participating in these models. May not want to do it. Is this something that any of you have encountered in your uh, and or, or queried on as part of your research designs, uh, or have you heard it qualitatively? Uh, so I'll just put that out there from uh, somebody in the audience. We hear it all the time, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, a lot of the things we've been talking about, which is, you know, training helps a lot, simply exposing people and having them run through practice sessions. I think a lot of it is not necessarily, you know, it was technology resistance. I don't think it's technology resistance. I think it's just new. You know, people don't like to do anything that's new. And if you can make it as easy as possible for a provider to engage in telemedicine and don't put the burden of 
setting everything up for them on the on the on the shoulders of the clinician. You got to remember it's a team effort to make telemedicine work properly. And so if we can present it to providers in that way and provide them the support that they need to be able to go into an encounter prepared, I think that that ha has worked in the past. And having people do real life, you know, fake telemedicine sessions, go through a few of them. People learn, oh, it's really not as bad as I thought. Oh, this is how I can do a virtual physical exam. Oh, this is what I can't do. You give people that opportunity to practice a little bit, and then they're far more willing to part engage in telemedicine, you know, when it gets to the real situation. Um, there is a question in the chat uh, or in the questions actually about the problems of getting a clinician on the line that um, that sometimes there are either people who don't have time or don't want to be the consultant. And is that something that other people have encountered, particularly this came up with one of the telehealth resource and assistance centers at a different meeting? So I think Elizabeth was just responding to that um, question. Is there anything else that anyone would care to add to that? Okay, sorry. Um, I think that face might be, but thank you, Annette, for, for helping, because sometimes sorry, you're seeing some things I think I'm not seeing. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so let's just say last call for any other uh, questions or qu uh, comments uh, from the panelists or anything else that uh, these terrific speakers would care to add uh, just before we close this session out and I pass it back to Kate. Anything else that anyone would want to add that, that you didn't quite get um, framed in, the, in your remarks uh, or anything else from the panel? Wide open. Just don't be afraid to try something. I mean, just do it. Okay, with that, um, we'll go ahead then. Thanks, Elizabeth, for that last uh, um, encouragement to, to take a little bit of a risk. And uh, notwithstanding all of the um, uh, uh, you know, features of this fairly complex process uh, that need to be in place, and you're making your earlier case about um, uh, ensuring that there are, is wraparound of support, adequate training, uh, engagement, even backing this right into education of healthcare professionals as part of their a standard curricula, um, all, all really good observations uh, um, that, that ought to help people get to the just do it uh, um, point that you just made. So with that, thank you all. And I'm going to pass it right back to uh, Kate. And we will, um, uh, I think, have a quick break and go to our keynote speaker. Kate, anything else you'd like to add in? Yeah, yeah thanks so much, Mary. And thanks for serving as a workshop and panel chair over the past three days. We really appreciate it. Uh, so we'll now take a break until 2.45 is before the countdown clock on the screen will remind you when to, when to come back. We've got two more speakers after the break, including our final keynote. We're really excited about both of them. So we will see you at 2.45. Thank you. And our much. lightning round. And the lightning round with all of our speakers. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everyone. Okay, everyone, welcome back. We are going to get started again. Um, we have just a couple of sessions left in this um, P2P workshop on rural telehealth. So we're almost at the end and thank you for sticking through with us. We will now hear from our final speaker, from our final speakers and um, first from Dr. John Cullen, our final keynote speaker. And he'll be presenting notes from the Frontier Rural Peer-to-Peer -peer Network. So Dr. Cullen, thank you for joining us. Go right ahead. Well, thank you very much. And it's an honor to be presenting in front of you and a little bit humbling given <clears throat> the quality of the lecture so far. Uh, next. 
So in terms of disclosures, I do work within the Providence healthcare system and uh, have a contract um, for the provision of emergency medical services. I am uh, in private practice, however, and so that's really uh, more for the emergency room. Um, but it does give me access to the network. Can I have the next slide? So this is where I, this is Valdez, Alaska, and I've been here for the last 27 years. So this is actually the view about a, a couple hundred yards away from the hospital entrance. And uh, it's an incredibly beautiful place. Uh, there's a couple of caveats I should probably mention right off the bat. One is that this is a community of 4,000 people. And so uh, there are, um, our numbers are small. And that's something that's been discussed quite a bit over these uh, these last couple of days. I've always called it the problem of N, where we'll have a full hospital um, one minute and then we'll be completely empty within a couple of days. We'll have three appendicitis in, uh, in a week and then none for another couple of months. And so the, <clears throat> the statistical problem of small populations is, uh, is a real thing for us. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing is, is that if you've seen one rural community, you've seen one rural community. And, um, and so I'm primarily going to be talking from the perspective of, of my own experience. Next slide. And uh, <clears throat> so this is our hospital. This is a 10 bed critical access hospital. Uh, we do uh, uh, labor and delivery uh, as well as ER and inpatients. Um, we have a tele ICU uh, program as well as tele stroke. Uh, and then uh, we have a private clinic, my partners and I uh, adjacent to the hospital. Next slide. So we live in an incredibly beautiful place, but I have to say that we also have some of the worst weather. Um, so that we get a lot of snow. Um, my wife is not a short person and uh, it's typical. This is actually a pretty typical snowfall uh, for the winter. Um, with this, uh, next slide, uh, we get um, uh, a lot of uh, cloudy days. We get winds of over 100 miles an hour. Um, the result is, is that we end up having to take care of patients for a prolonged period of time. And regardless of, you know, what the complexity of their, of their conditions are, just because we just cannot transport people. Next slide. And sometimes um, we have this. So this is an avalanche that closed off the only road to town. And um, it's a quarter mile long, 80 feet tall. And then there was a river that is on the other side of it that was dammed, uh, creating a lake. It was called the dam and, uh, and so. We were actually unable to move anybody out for about a week uh, during that time. I should also mention that we are about 300 miles away from the nearest tertiary care hospital. Next. And uh, despite this, so this is where we are next. Um, this is actually a map of infant mortality and uh, where we are actually, we have a remarkably low infant mortality given how, um, how remote we are. Um, and, <clears throat> but part of that is because we, we do offer um, obstetrical services. This is going to be more relevant in just a few minutes. Next slide. <clears throat> and one of the reasons why this is so important for us is that if you look at maternal mortality, um, only a third roughly occurs within the week around delivery. And um, so that what that means is that the vast majority of morbidity and mortality for, for women during pregnancy actually occurs within the communities where they live. And, um, and we recognized that early on that we needed to be able to provide a really robust um, obstetrical uh, care uh, for our community because even if we were not planning on doing deliveries, we would still be doing deliveries. We just would not be ready uh, for the obstetrical emergencies when they happened. Next. And has been me mentioned now several times is that if we look at rural outcomes, they are um, much worse. And I'm not sure why this slide was cut off, but um, this is a look at uh, maternal um, uh, mortality, rural versus urban. And you know, there's a couple of things. One is that we've been seeing an increase in maternal mortality um, across the board, but uh, that it is um, accelerating within rural communities. And largely that's because of loss of, of, uh, of uh, maternity care within the, a lot of rural communities. Next. <clears throat> and distance matters. Um, so it, like I said, it's 300 miles uh, to drive to Anchorage. And um, this is Thompson Pass. Um, typically um, in the winter time, it's gonna be really cold. We're talking, you know, 40 below zero. And even on the other side of the pass, if you can get down to 70 below. 
Um, what that means is, is that if you're driving to Anchorage for doctor's appointments, um, you had better hope that your car is in really good shape because a breakdown on this road um, could be a life-threatening event. Uh, there certainly is um, air travel when the weather, when the planes can fly. And so we actually use quite a bit of telemedicine. Um, and, uh, and so that's why I was so excited to be able to talk about this uh, uh, to you uh, today. Next slide. <clears throat> so we've, we've been used to having um, uh, delays in transportation and taking care of actually some fairly critical pa patients. Um, that has gotten much worse with COVID, and I'm sure that will, many of you are aware that Alaska now is under crisis standards of care, which means that we are, um, uh, our hospitals are, are basically completely full. Uh, we uh, in Valdez have been unable to transfer anybody um, for periods of time. Um, and it's, even when we're able to, it's very difficult. And this has been going now for the last three weeks. And so uh, uh, we've been taking care of a lot of things that we would really rather not um, rather not take care of. And so it's um, it's been a really interesting time where there's been a um, even more than normal. We've been unable to transfer patients. Next slide. So <clears throat> we have tele ICU, and we've been using tele ICU now for about the last ten years. Um, it may even be longer than that. Um, We've had a series of other telemedicine uh, programs over the years, but um, I think that this one has been uh, one of the more successful. Though it's kind of funny because the first time that I really um, encountered it, uh, we had we had set up the program uh, with Providence, uh, and it was a part of their ICU in Anchorage. And uh, uh, but the equipment had just been sort of sitting there uh, in the corner. This had been there for a couple of months. And so when you have equipment like that, you just sort of ignore it after a while. I got called into the uh, ICU. And when I say ICU, that's a very liberal term in that we have one bed that we designate as an ICU. It's really not any different than any other ones, except it's closer to the nurse's station. Um, but it was called in at 2.30 in the morning for a patient of mine that was having trouble breathing. Um, and actually was decompensating. And it was kind of a wild ride just to get to the hospital because it was blowing uh, 60 or 70 and snowing. Yeah, but got to the hospital and I just lived real close within uh, within a mile. Um, but I <laughs> um, was, we were getting ready to intubate this patient and it was uh, myself and a, a two of my nurses, both women. And uh, all of a sudden I heard this deep voice say, huh, looks like she's decompensating. And I looked around trying to figure out where this voice was coming from. It's something that's really uh, odd to hear uh, voices and couldn't tell where it was coming from, whether it was a voice of God or whatever. But, um, and then this voice said, looks like you need to intubate. And I was like, yeah, I know. Um, but that's when I realized what had happened is, is that the telemedicine cart had a big button on the side. One of us had bumped into it inadvertently and turned on the machine. And I had an ICU physician looking over my shoulder. And uh, and that was really nice. Um, it was uh, it it certainly made me feel less isolated, and um, and it was it was good. But I think the other part of that is that uh, no matter how good that telemedicine cart is, and how good the ICU physician is, um, they would still need me to be able to have the skills to be able to intubate that patient. And that's one of the things that I find that is uh, is an issue uh, with uh, telemedicine. A lot of times, it's sort of seen as a as a solution for uh, a lot of the um, the provider um, uh, the lack of providers in rural communities. And um, but you still need to have those really well trained um, generalist providers in those communities in order to be able to um, to do the procedures that are that are life saving. And and I just don't see that that's going to change anytime soon. The other thing that's really nice about our telemedicine program, the tele ICU, is that uh, when I have a patient, um, it, they and their family want to know that everything possible can be done, and um, and then having that that second uh, physician in the room is just very useful in terms of, um, of uh, uh, patients and their families feeling uh, confident in the care that's being provided, even if the care itself is not any different than uh, than it would have been otherwise. Next. 
There is um, a lot of telemedicine, peer-to-peer -peer telemedicine that is going on that is not being documented. And um, like I said, we have a really robust um, OB program. And part of that was because I have uh, uh, really strong relationships with um, perinatologists in Anchorage. And uh, it's nice that we're part of a network in that they can, uh, they can see the images that I'm taking. So this, uh, for example, if I do an ultrasound, um, they can see it not in real time, but in, in, it's certainly in store for it because we're all on the same system. Um, and it's really nice to be able to have that, that that phone consultation and then review the images that we get. A lot of times that's really all that's necessary and you don't really need fancy equipment to do this. You're just a regular phone. Um, you don't really need to see the specialist face in order to have that consultation. It's really about the information. Uh, further, uh, we, have, um, we have a shared electronic medical record system between uh, our hospital and the, um, the hospital that we refer patients. And so they actually can see everything that I'm seeing as far as lab tests and other imaging um, as soon as, as I see it. So uh, it really does make for, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, for to real time consults. Uh, what I don't know is how you would be able to capture what is actually going on. As physicians, we're very good about it being as efficient as possible. And, um, and so anything that slows us down when we're busy, we're just going to uh, ignore it in favor of something that is, that is easier, even if that means that we don't get um, paid um, if the payment is, is um, fairly low. And um, um, <clears throat> yeah, I just was thinking about the, uh, my consultant for perinatology uh, was somebody that would talk about cases on a regular basis and, and they're sort of anticipating those problems long before they came. Part of the reason why we're able to do what we're doing is by risk stratification and making sure that we're only delivering those babies that um, that we feel comfortable doing, uh, recognizing that there's going to be complications that are arising. Um, in this particular one, I called them up because I had a concerns about a patient who was coming in in labor, um, and we talked about the case, and I heard all this commotion going on. And I, so I asked him what was happening, and then he said, well, they're prepping me for surgery. Um, I'll be out for a little bit. Um, and then... Uh, uh, he called me up later on that afternoon um, uh, when he was after he had recovered just to check on how things went. And, you know, that's just really going above and beyond. Um, but um, but that level of commitment is really uh, it's incredibly valuable to us in these in these rural communities. Next. And I wanted to really bring up this part, too, which is the um, the nursing staff. Um, I think that that's something also that is really uh, not um, being analyzed as much as it probably should be, because um, we really are a team. Uh, and like any team, there is a there is a lot of discussion and a lot of give and take about um, how we do things. Um, rural nursing should be considered a, a specialty of nursing. It's uh, it's incredibly difficult. Um, all of my nurses um, are generalist nurses. They help me push TPA for a stroke in one room and then help me deliver a baby in another, um, go to the OR and then, uh, and then take care of somebody who's dying. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly broad um, and uh, broad field and one that's really it has a lot of depth to it. Um, all of my nurses actually are, um, are certified in, in basically all the nursing certifications you can get, everything from PALS to um, ICU to um, uh, the trauma, life support. Um, I mean, it's, it, is, it is really extraordinary how much they have um, uh, done their training and, and really done their training uh, within, this, uh, within this extremely uh, rural and, and really a frontier environment. <clears throat> the other part of that, though, <clears throat> is that, you know, it's interesting from a tele-ICU perspective, uh, for example, uh, one of their big fears is that we're going to keep people that um, that they're going to be uncomfortable uh, watching over. So, for example, if I have somebody with a major head injury, it doesn't really make any sense for us to do telemedicine in our uh, ICU bed um, if what they really need is a craniotomy at some point because we just can't do that. And so um, 
So the, the types of cases that we choose to keep um, utilizing those telemedicine resources is, is really, really key. And so as you may be finding, <clears throat> there is some resistance to using telemedicine uh, among nurses just because they don't wanna be stuck managing patients, even with the use of tele-IC that, um, that they just don't feel comfortable doing. <clears throat> the other side of that is that they, um, it's really important that the that telemedicine and peer to peer telemedicine resources are available um, to to nurses as well. I think that's just a that's an incredibly uh, important part of them feeling comfortable um, with uh, what they're doing. And you know that comfort component is is incredibly important. And you know, we've talked about uh, burnout, I think, a few times uh, during these talks. And um, and that discomfort um, with taking care of, you know, really fairly critical patients within this environment is one of the things that leads to burnout, especially if there's bad outcomes. And so it's really important that the, um, the nursing staff feels, um, you know, has those resources that are available. I think that <clears throat> if you're looking at outcome measurements, um, I think that probably one of the, the most uh, important, at least from my perspective, is the um, is the retaining of, of uh, staff within these rural hospitals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next. And like I said, we've had a succession of um, of uh, telemedicine programs over the years. Um, I love Dr. Usher Pines' picture <clears throat> much better than mine because it had a cobweb over the front of it. Um, I really <clears throat> I think we used ours more for a coat rack, but uh, we've had a number of these carts over the years that um, that really um, have not been useful. And and I have to admit that I, at times, been very um, upset looking at this uh, really expensive cart and wishing I just had the money in order to recruit another physician. Um, one of the problems that we had with these carts is that we really didn't have any networks within which we could work to use them. And, um, and so uh, besides that, they really were not geared for what we were doing. Uh, and like I said, most of what we needed is to be able to discuss a case with a consultant in real time um, and then look at images. That's really the main thing. And um, and we didn't really need a, an electronic otoscope and um, stethoscope and a lot of other those things because I can describe what I'm hearing. Having said that, um, within the Native Alaskan uh, healthcare system, um, they've used those carts amazingly well with village health aides. And so I think that it's really important to just, you know, it's not a one size fits all uh, kind of issue. Um, this is something where um, under the right circumstances, I think it would be incredibly useful. Uh, but what we really needed were more providers. Next. So the ideal tertiary care specialist consultant. Um, and this, I think, is, and that's something that um, I don't know if we've really talked. I know we've talked a little bit about making sure that there's education of consultants. And I think that's incredibly important. Part of that is that they need to know what are the capabilities of the rural providers and the care facility. And um, <clears throat> I was told once that I uh, needed to get a CAT scan on a patient uh, when we actually didn't have a CAT scan in our facility. Um, and when I told him that, he said that I just needed to go look. He, he was sure that I had one. And uh, and so knowing what those um, uh, those capabilities are on the part of the, of the consultant is really really key. Um, I I find it you know, it's very offensive when I'm talking with somebody and, and they recognize that I'm coming from a rural community and and they slow down their speech and talk in simple words. Um, it's you know it's 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 sort of an interesting thing. It's sort of the um, I I think that some people think that. Either I've got the uh, Mayo Clinic of the North or that I'm operating out of the back of my truck. And so, um, and I think that part of that, I, I think that if we are going to have uh, uh, metropolitan urban consultants, they should really go out and do tours of the facilities um, or even uh, do shifts just to know what the capabilities are and what are the difficulties. Um, I think that the ideal consultant is somebody that. <clears throat> is capable of communicating through several modalities um, and, um, and is, that it's easy to get a hold of them. They should be available 24 seven. And I recognize that that's not realistic. Um, 
But in the, for example, in the case of our tele ICU, that's only available from nine in the evening until nine in the morning. And so uh, during the day I can get a hold of people, but it's really not through that uh, tele ICU program. I think there are programs available um, in particular, um, I've toured the Avera site. And I think that that's, that's a really um, powerful tool just in terms of having people being available uh, in real time. Um, <clears throat> Right then. All right, next. And actually, I should just go back. You can still stay in the slide, but um, it's really important um, that the interaction is a positive one between the consultant and the uh, person doing telemedicine within the rural community. Um, being um, you know being denigrated just means that the those physicians in rural communities are just not going to uh, want to use those programs. And unfortunately, there is some of that. I mean, there's a little bit of a metropolitan bias among some consultants. Um, I was actually even told that uh, um, they thought that all healthcare should be delivered in the metropolitan area, which I didn't really have any response to. That's my community again. And uh, like I said, we've been uh, fairly isolated now for the last three weeks. The um, it's getting a little bit better, and we've certainly got programs in place to be able to transfer patients uh, easier. Um, but it really has been interesting. Um, it doesn't take a natural disaster uh, to um, to really cause the the normal referral patterns to change. Uh, and in this case, only twenty eight percent of the patients in Anchorage uh, have COVID. But that extra twenty eight percent on top of the normal flow has meant that the healthcare system is really broken down and that we're into this crisis level of care. And so I think that it's what that shows is that we really do need to decentralize care uh, to uh, probably a more ex a greater extent than we are currently. And the telemedicine is definitely a component of that. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> but there's a lot of different elements to that. Um, so this was the uh, CME webinar series that uh, came out, that was April 3rd. Um, and that was actually, I think they started back um, in uh, the very beginning of March. And um, and that was, <clears throat> that was incredibly important <clears throat> in terms of getting information out. This was something that was store forward. Um, it was incredibly important for not only communication, um, but also for that sense of community that we were not in this alone. And um, something else, too, that was really interesting about COVID is uh, about 65% of family physicians started doing telemedicine for the first time in, in that first week in, in March. And uh, it was only possible because we had platforms that were inexpensive, they were intuitive and easy to use, and could be just incorporated into the regular, um, uh, the regular workflow. Um, I know that our clinic uh, basically closed our emergency room that first week and just did everything by telemedicine. And we're continuing to do um, probably at least 30% of our visits by telemedicine. And uh, and so, but the only reason why we can do it is that there was very little in the way of friction. Um, I, I loved uh, Dr. Dynick's uh, uh, sludge and, and all those friction points about it, one of the things that did really keep us from utilizing telemedicine to its greatest extent. Um, this was easy. And the thing is, is those platforms we can actually use um, for peer-to-peer -peer telemedicine as well. Inviting people into the um, telemedicine rooms would be easy. Um, the hard thing is just getting, um, getting uh, schedules aligned and getting people um, available. Uh, otherwise, I think this would be uh, just an expansion of that uh, of that kind of those telemedicine platforms from physician to patient would, would it work well. Um, next slide. I think that's just a gratuitous Alaska picture. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, so next slide. And we've talked about Project Echo and it really is um, effective. And it's effective um, both in terms of it being uh, uh, educational uh, but it's also really effective in terms of the community. And um, and that's something I think that has been, again, for the for this particular pandemic, has been incredibly important is to have those um, online communities that you could be a part of that also provided education. I think that that was, that was really, really key. 
Next slide. And I know that we've talked a lot about, um, you know, things like, it seems like everybody's very familiar with uh, Project Echo. These are the number of hubs that have increased. Um, and it really has been substantial in the last couple of years. Uh, next slide. And there's also just been this incredible increase in attendance. And I think that this is something that can be leveraged as well. I think that this program is a really good one. And certainly for us has been, has been really useful. Next slide. So recommendations. Um, one of the things that I thought was really, really important is the, um, the idea that the learning, uh, you see that learning curve. And I think that that's actually something that's not a bug, that's a feature of telemedicine and something that really needs to be pushed. Um, the only reason why we can do what we do is because we have um, a really highly trained team and we do a lot of simulations. And I think that that's something that's incredibly important is to, um, to use telemedicine to um, gear up, to really refine that, that, that team-based approach to critical care within rural settings. When, when COVID came out, one of the things that we did is we started practicing doing non-aerosolizing intubation for people with COVID, thinking that that was going to be what we needed to do. Um, we worked on that, and then we did a simulation with uh, telepresence with some, some ER physicians down at the uh, University of uh, Oregon. Um, watching what, how our, our technique was. And I think that that was just incredibly uh, valuable. Next slide. Obviously we need broadband, um, but we also need to preserve those rural hospitals, uh, especially with ICU and maternity care capabilities. I think that's the only way we're gonna address a lot of the uh, rural maternity um, uh, mortality. Um, and then just, we need to really maintain those, <clears throat> those providers, you know, both nurses and physicians and, and PAs and, and nurse practitioners within these rural communities. Next slide. And I think that if, <clears throat> if the telemedicine can do that, um, I think that that is gonna be extremely valuable. And I think that those simulations, that educational component um, is really important because we deal with these low volume, high acuity events um, we may get one every few years. And so we can't really train for that by just doing those cases. We have to train for them by doing simulations. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, and uh, if you're gonna do um, specialty rural provider consultations for emergencies, they really needs to be available 24 seven. And at that, that push of a button is to have that telepresence. We actually use this um, in, our, in our ER. We don't have tele-ER, but when we have a, running a code, we actually bring in another physician to just run, be the role of a proctor. And I think that that's really um, just making sure that everything gets done, I think is, is, is useful. Um, but we don't have that available where we are. Next slide. And we are using ICU, telestroke, and ER. Um, I would love to have a neonatal ICU component. I think that would be useful. Uh, maternal fetal medicine, unfortunately, my consultant just uh, left the state, so I have to work on that relationship. Um, next slide. <clears throat> and next slide. Um, and then um, just having that, that concept of the physician, patient, and then the consultant all in the same room even though we'd be 300 uh, miles apart, I think is, is some, it's a worthwhile goal. And I was really excited about the, um, uh, the project uh, that uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Richard Pines uh, described, the Warden Project, because um, again, you have that ability just to consult with people right at the, the time you need them rather than trying to coordinate schedules. Next slide. And you can use that for a lot of different specialty care. Next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> but things have to be really easy. And um, you know, the easiest is, um, is just using texting, uh, but we can't do that because of HIPAA. But if we could do just de-identified medical images, I think that would be incredibly valuable. Next slide. And I think that finally is that we need to recognize that telemedicine is a tool, but it's not a solution. Really the solution is to have well-trained people in these rural communities um, because telemedicine can't intubate, they can't um, deliver babies. It's hard to talk people through a lot of those things if they don't have the training. But telemedicine is a way of providing that training and to really develop those teams. And I think that that's, um, 
I think that's actually one of the more profound things that could happen uh, with, with telemedicine. Um, and we don't have to really focus on the technology. We've got the technology. We don't really need the robots and things like that, as exciting as those are. What we really need is those networks and this uh, ability to schedule and staff is really, I think, the most important things. And ultimately, that relationship uh, between the role provider and the specialist as it has been mentioned multiple times during this conference. It, it must be the most important part. Next slide. And thank you very much. I greatly appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. That was really interesting to hear your real world examples from, from Alaska that kind of supported all the research we've heard the past couple of days. Um, so thanks so much. Okay, so we'll now turn to Dr. Wakefield to moderate our final discussion session. Go ahead, Mary. Thanks, Kate. And Dr. Colin, thank you so much for those remarks. I um, I think it's a uh, just a tremendous uh, opportunity to hear the real world application of so much of what we've been discussing over the last few days. So so your expertise uh, is and and um, perspectives are really valuable. I also want to say that notwithstanding the photograph of the avalanche across the highway, what great recruiting photos. <laughs> <laughs> for for clinicians perhaps to join you what a beautiful uh, scenic backdrop uh, for your for you and and your work um with that let me just turn to my colleagues on the panel first and see whether or not there are any questions uh from any of them uh, and then if and as we have time in this very brief few minutes i'll surely take questions from the audience as well but first to my colleagues on the panel any questions or comments uh, for dr colin Yeah, well, first, I'd like to say hi, uh, John. I, sorry I wasn't on at the very beginning of your talk. Um, uh, I was on another meeting, but uh, really appreciate uh, your pragmatic um, thoughts on the application and, and how that serves. And I, I really liked um, you bringing up the use of uh, telemedicine as a, a, a means of delivering simulation training uh, for those low volume, high risk um, activities. Um, it's not something that we've heard a lot about um, on that. And I think uh, you also brought up something that uh, critical, I think, is a lot of times the relationships we have with the specialist we utilize um, goes a long ways. And sometimes when we're looking at telemedicine across state lines and even further, um, not having those relationships and, and those folks not understanding the challenges of delivering healthcare in a rural setting is certainly a, a challenge, as you brought out. So uh, thanks for your insights and uh, uh, being the keynote. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, other comments from other panelists or questions? Um, I, I'd like to ask you just one. Your a major focus, obviously, of our work is to look at the research gaps, of course, in the use of telehealth technology as a facilitator of provider to provider uh, communication. Is there anything that comes to mind from where you sit, where you'd be thinking, "Here's an area for exploration. Here's an area where more evidence could be really helpful to me as a as a very rural uh, provider." Uh, um, what, based on everything you've heard, because it sounds like you've been uh, coming in and out probably of the meetings over the last few days, are there or would there be a research question or two where you'd think, gosh, it'd be so helpful to know uh, fill in the blank. So from the, the vantage point of a frontline rural provider, any thoughts there? <clears throat> I think several. One is that uh... I think it is important to make sure that you're including the nursing staff and other staff within the hospital in any research project, um, because they are a critical player uh, within rural uh, healthcare systems. And so, um, it's it's <clears throat> it's important, I think, to look at providers, but also look at um, satisfaction uh, with nursing personnel. I think that along with that is um, looking at uh, retention of uh, rural providers. Uh, and uh, rural nursing, I think that's also really a, a really key because uh, we really are at a um, at a critical point. Um, I really like Dr. McGrath's talk uh, when he was talking about how 
just keeping, um, uh, I can't remember what the percentage was, increased the, the, his bottom line by half a percent, which um, could make all the difference between a hospital staying solvent or not. Um, and I think that the, those kind of economic models are probably also really important, especially since we're seeing really a um, really fairly rapid closure of rural and frontier hospitals across the country, and that's certainly contributing to the um, maternal mortality crisis that we're, we're encountering, as well as just the, the worst outcomes within rural communities. And then um, lastly, I really am intrigued about the idea of doing um, a peer-to-peer -peer, um, educational kind of format uh, for simulations. Um, that is something I thought that um, of all the take-home experiences um, that I've had in the last 18 months, I think that that was actually one of the, um, the most profound, um, just having that telepresence. Because um, we can go, we can create our own simulation, uh, but, um, and it's really unreasonable for trainers to travel to all these rural communities, uh, but, um, but it was important to have the, uh, but just by doing that, we could, we don't have to have the travel and we have the expertise um, as we go through our, our protocols. Um, so I think that that was really incredibly valuable. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that observation. Well, for all of those observations, but for that observation as well, that, that, uh, you know, obviously case study um, discussions, et cetera, high value, but in addition, the, your emphasis on the simulation side of this uh, is, I think the first time we might have heard it, or at least uh, uh, um, heard, heard it with this emphasis. So that's very helpful. Likewise, your comment about the other providers. We've had a little bit of conversation during the course of these last few days about what the extent to which um, uh, uh, telemedicine plays differently, uh, that technology utilization plays differently depending on the provider type. So you might think physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, pharmacist, et cetera. So uh, even all the way back to a much earlier conversation about the cultures of each of the disciplines and, and, and what difference that makes in terms of how they uh, engage the technology, uh, the extent to which they use the information and so on which sort of backs into your comment about nurses specifically. And you mentioned Avera, I haven't looked at that model recently, but they had, for example, critical care nurses also, I believe at Avera, um, I don't think I'm confusing that with another system, but critical care nurses have backed up critical care nurses in, in rural hospitals. And, and so you're underscoring the importance of all providers in the equation, uh, having a degree of comfort and how do we get, how do we achieve that, to really maximize uh, that, uh, uh, that connectivity and maybe in the process, keeping patients local, um, uh, who can be managed locally uh, effectively when the entire team has a, a high degree of comfort with engage in terms of engaging with that uh, that patient. So, so thanks for calling those out. Do you have any other final comments before we turn back then to uh, the next uh, uh, presentation, which should be pretty exciting and some of that's going to fall right on some of what you're talking about with Project Echo? Anything <laughs> else, Dr. Colin? I just said I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. We're delighted. Thanks. Kate, back to you then. Okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Wakefield. We will now hear from our final speaker, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Aurora, on the Project ECHO as a new modality for provider to provider communication. Thank you, Dr. Aurora. Well, thank you, Kate, and um, thanks to the NIH for this invitation. I want to give a little warning here that my presentation will not be as beautiful as Dr. John Cullen's. Uh, and but um, so I'm going to talk about what Echo is and how it works and what is the evidence base. Based, but uh, use the evidence base to point out what the limitations in design of Echo studies have been and um, what could be uh, areas for future research. So ECHO stands for Extension for Community Health Outcomes, and it started in 2000. And, uh, the idea came to me uh, in the early 2000s, but in 2001, I, I saw a patient in my clinic. I'm a gastroenterologist by profession, and she was a 43-year-old woman, and in the room was a 14-year-old boy and a 9-year-old girl, and I asked her, how can I help you? And she said, I have hepatitis C and I want treatment. So I said, uh, how long have you had it? And she said, I've had it for eight years. My next question was, why did you not come earlier for treatment? And she said, you know, she had called my nurse and there was an eight month wait to see me. And the nurse had said, you would have to make 
uh, 12 trips to see me and uh, I live 200 miles away and I, I'm a single mother. There was no way I could take so much time off work, so I decided not to get treatment. And um, also your nurse had said this was a chemotherapy like regimen. So I said, um, why did you come today? And she said, I'm having pain here in the right upper side of my abdomen. We did an ultrasound of her abdomen and she found uh, a liver cancer sort of halfway between a tennis ball and a golf ball. And it was too late to treat her now and she passed away six months later. And I was left asking this question, why did she die when I had all the medicines available and um, all the diagnostic tests were available? Uh, really, um, there was no resource constraint there specifically in, in uh, giving her care, but she died because the right knowledge didn't exist at the right place at the right time. And this was a real big problem for me because at this time in New Mexico, 28,000 patients had already been diagnosed with hepatitis C and less than 1,500 had been treated. We knew that, you know, if we don't treat all these people, and there were no specialists, not a single primary care doctor in New Mexico was giving this treatment, which was these weekly injections and pills uh, with lots of side effects. And, um, and the challenge was many, many thousands would die unnecessarily like my patient. So in 2003, I came up with this model called the ECHO model, which uh, has four key ideas in it. One is, could we amplify specialty expertise using technology, one-to-many video conferencing like we are using today. The second I, part of this ECHO model is to share best practices. So what I did was I was trying to figure out how do I get all these 28,000 on treatment? So I went, went around the state of New Mexico talking to primary care clinicians like Dr. John Cullen and telling them, hey, would you be willing to become an expert in hepatitis C if I mentored you? and then serve your community? This was not about provider to provider consultation. It was about provider to provider mentoring because the need was so great. And I went around and gave them my protocols and everything, but literally every one of them said, no, this is too toxic. This is too dangerous. We can't give interferon here. So I asked myself, how did you become an expert in treating hepatitis C when I was Doing my fellowship in Boston in Massachusetts, I would see a patient present to my professor. I would see another one present to my professor. And after two years, they started calling me a gastroenterologist. So I said, aha, I'm gonna use this model to create new hepatitis C specialists in New Mexico so that they can serve their whole communities. And then the fourth principle is to monitor these outcomes. So in 2003, I started the first teleeco clinic where all 21, of these clinics were joined simultaneously in an interactive video network, always Wednesday, 3 to 5 p.m., and one by one present patients to each other about hepatitis C. And this was um, really, um, so in two hours, we would co-manage about eight patients and 15 minutes, either the psychiatrist on my team or the pharmacist, or I would give a 15 minute lecture. So every echo clinic was standard, about one hour, 45 minutes cases, 15 minutes lecture. And as we did this week after week, we started evaluating it. And the first thing we wanted to evaluate, very biased studies. We asked these um, individuals, was it increasing their professional satisfaction? Was it reducing isolation? Was their self-efficacy going up? Subsequently, did their knowledge go up? And we were getting very positive results. But of course, this was there was no counterfactual here and basically uh, but ultimately, we had to show that these rural doctors could actually get the same level of outcomes as we were doing at the university. We were funded by AHRQ to do this uh, prospective cohort study between rural areas and the university, my clinic. Of course, the challenge was, we all know, as we've heard, a prospective cohort study, you know, there is the problem of unmeasured covariates and it's not a perfect design. Uh, so what we found was um, 
we wanted to do a randomized control trial, sort of, we would, we had the money. The problem was, how do we randomize rural doctors to get echo support or no echo support when no rural doctor had ever treated hepatitis C? And um, it wouldn't be ethical to have them give chemo in a rural area. We couldn't randomize patients to come to the university or be in Silver City five hours away. Uh, because then some patients would have to travel these distances. It was just very difficult to get a randomized trial. We could do a cluster randomized trial, randomizing clinics. The challenge was then half the clinics, which had no gastroenterology support or liver disease, would have no treatment for these patients, and that wouldn't pass any ethical muster. The other thing we were doing, so what actually was going on in ECHO was this issue of we, what we were trying to do is we were first giving these providers declarative knowledge. Then as they came week after week, we gave them procedural knowledge. And but the ultimate goal was to make them autonomous through iterative guided practice. But what we realized was what was making echo work was a phenomenon we described called all teach all learn. Where even experts were learning from primary care because they actually knew what the barriers were in their local areas. They knew exactly what the challenges were. They knew the social, cultural, economic circumstances and could really adapt expert knowledge to their um, individual circumstances. So the New England Journal of Medicine paper that we published basically showed that we were able to improve care for minorities, uh, but the cure rate was identical in the rural areas and prisons as it was in the university. But of course, it had all the limitations of a prospective cohort study. And um, we subsequently did a propensity score matching to try and figure out. And the results were surprising that the rural areas and prisons actually did better than the university uh, after they were matched that way. So one, of course, we are talking about telehealth and telemedicine where you talk manage a patient or one-to-one -one provider to provider interaction where this uh, specialist in black at the bottom is helping another provider in blue. Our purpose is very different. We are supporting many, many uh, primary care teams with the idea of building massive capacity. We call, it, we call this idea of force multiplication. Can we increase the capacity to do this 10 times or more? because the need is enormous. Uh, here's an example of the need for dermatology in New Mexico. Blue area means there are no dermatologists on the left side, if you just look at that. Green is that we have less than a quarter, and yellow means we have a quarter of them. So we have 33 dermatologists, but we need 120. So the issue then is, I could not put myself on a camera because I was working all out seeing patients and putting myself on a camera to manage an individual patient. I just didn't have the time for that. The only way I could treat everybody was replicate myself, which is the idea of echo. So then, of course, we realized that this problem was not about hepatitis C and we replicated echo in a huge number of diseases as shown here, which I won't go into diabetes, cancer, bone health, high risk pregnancy, LGBT health and so on and so forth. And um, we, we came up with a goal that we want to help a billion people. And the way to do that, we realized was to treat train other universities in the world. So we have now 332 hubs, all the practically all the major universities in the United States have already replicated ECHO. And globally, we have 606 hubs, as uh, John Cullen mentioned. And before COVID-19, about 70% of the land area in the United States had an echo learner located there. We were having this tremendous growth, uh, 230,000 attendances in 2019, went up to 1.3 million in 2020. And now in, uh, we've exceeded a million as of September 30th, with total attendances at 2.9 million. The evaluations that have happened there's never really been significant funding for ECHO evaluations. The federal government has doled out about a billion dollars for implementing ECHO 
but less than 3% of it has been to evaluate ECHO. So all these people have sort of done this on their own and there have been significant design flaws, but there were 406 publications, 325 showing doctors like to participate, 225 they are satisfied, 200 their declarative knowledge goes up. Again, there was really no control arms here, procedural knowledge, the 101 publications showing changes to practice all came from reviewing electronic medical records and 59 showing patient health outcomes. I'll give you examples. So um, a variety of diseases were studied by our partners. There are 157 different organizations, universities in the world that have published on all these different areas showing improvement. And these uh, you can see uh, access to HIV and the retroviral therapy improves again all of, uh, the same problem e exists is that many of these don't have an adequate control arm a few that have control arms were based on essentially um, electronic records so this is an example from the VA adopting echo 513 patients uh, with cirrhosis versus the rest of the database and they showed the mortality. Uh, there was a 50% reduction roughly in mortality and they used propensity score matching to try and match these groups. Um, another pub from the VA showing 6,400 versus 32,000 patients that 21% of them with uh, got treatment uh, if they were presented versus two and a half percent. And the US Department of Defense uh, show, uh, DOD echo showing that they were able to really dramatically improve opioid prescriptions in 99 clinics that participated versus the control 1283. Again, these are data records rather than um, um, prospective randomized control trials. Then there is this problem of natural experiments occurring, which are not rigorous studies, but this is Punjab in India where they were treating 1500 patients at the academic center, um, enrolled 25 district hospitals, treated 48,000 published in the leading European Journal of Liver Disease with a cure rate of 91.6. Not an experiment, but what the neighboring states didn't have these patients treated. And so there are some natural experiments occurring um, we recently used ECHO and launched 100 hubs and with AHRQ, enrolled 326 uh, hubs, I mean 326 networks weekly, 90 minutes each, enrolled 9,000 nursing homes in cohorts of 30 each for COVID-19 care. So what are my suggestions in the last minute for future research is potentially, if we do want patient level randomized control trials, it would need significant funding to either do stepwise design or cluster randomized trial. Randomizing individual patients doesn't work in ECHO because of contamination. The whole clinic's performance improves. We could study how telementoring uh, may impact the workforce development because the significant problem in the United States is workforce shortage, as Dr. Cullen was pointing out. Can we test whether ECHO model accelerates the dissemination of high impact therapeutics and whether we can improve care for orphan diseases? Could we examine the extent to which we can produce more health equity? Could we bridge the rural versus urban disparity? Could we Im improve recruitment of rural patients in rural health research networks, which are supported by ECHO. And then can ECHO be used for public health needs such as emergency preparedness or as we just recently used in infection control in nursing homes. And thank you for your attention and this opportunity to present to all of you. Back to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Dr. Rohr. We've heard a lot about ECHO the past couple of days, so it was really nice to be able to have you join us and give us your perspective and the history on it. Um, okay, so now our last step for the workshop, we will have a lightning recap of the whole workshop moderated by Dr. Aurora. So in the lightning round, each presenter will in one minute present a key takeaway or summary that stood out for them from this workshop. Uh, the order of the recap will be in the order presented on day one through day three. 
So at this time, we ask all of our presenters to turn on their cameras, but remain on mute until your name is called. And Dr. Aurora, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. So Kate was very smart. She gave me the job of uh, cutting you off at a minute. So I, I, have, I have no desire to do that. So please stick with your time. I'll first go to Krista Drobak. Please unmute. Krista? Okay. She is not on. Sorry. Uh, let's go to Ativ Mehrotra. Thanks, Ajit. Uh, you know, I, I think the maybe I'll start uh, my comments will be really focused on where you ended, which is that the real need in this space for more research. So, I mean, if there's an opportunity here, maybe as a nice starting place for the rest of the speakers is to really emphasize there is a real need for these kinds of models to be studied. And the 1 of the things that I really emphasize is to. Um, that it's going to be very disease specific in terms of what outcomes we look at. So there was this question of whether there could be something across all of these models. No, I think it matters upon what you're treating. Um, and then the last point was that I really emphasized in my talk, uh, and I, I hope has come through throughout, is the the need for the uh, intersection between financial payment models. Thinking that these models are just going to disseminate without that is going to be very problematic. Thank you. Um... Annette Totten. Okay. Um, first, I made a comment on the first day that local may be too small and national may be too big. I think for provider to provider telehealth to truly contribute in rural health, we have to consider what level we're operating on and that single site or single health system programs, particularly small rural ones, may be too small to study and too small to sustain. And on the other hand, national programs might not be as efficient and might obscure differences across characteristics or regions. Um, it came up that broadband may still be a significant barrier in the Mountain West than it, it is in New England, or the national might obscure differences in highest priority needs. We saw some maps that showed dis huge disparities in cardiovascular disease in the South, but not in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we need regional needs assessment, regionally tailored telehealth interventions, and then regional research and evaluation, I would argue. Then second, I'd just say that some presentations brought some really interesting patient provider examples in, and some of those may be applicable and some may not. I just want to um, ask us that we be clear about why we think they're applicable if we use them. Thank you. Um, thank you, Annette. And let's go to... Kelly Vithi, Dr. Kelly Vithi. Aloha. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. I'm a huge supporter of Project ECHO. Um, but this talk, this conference made me think about provider to provider telehealth and how we need to change the patient flow. So even for Project ECHO, we have to allocate time for the providers to do this. They need to be paid to participate. Um, they need to have some reimbursement. Um, we need to make sure that records are shared so that they have the information. We need to make sure that malpractice covers this. Um, and then, um, uh, as was just said, we need to keep it local enough that the participants or the consultants have the local cultural knowledge that is necessary. So if we pay this through Medicare, we need to pay more than $75, probably $100 per, per patient. Um, and if we can do this, we'll really help primary care providers. But if we just put it on top of a primary care provider's to-do list, it will not happen. We don't have enough time. We need to make this a systematic change that people are supported to do, but it could really work. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Christine Dimek. Okay, uh, uh, sorry, Stanley Sleffler. Kelly McGrath. Um, yeah, I, I think what was said by 1 of the speakers on the 1st day is a takeaway and uh, I can't remember it exactly, but it was sort of saying that provider to provider telemedicine, you know, asking if it's about its effectiveness is really like uh, asking if medicines work. We, we really need to refine that because until we know um, what. Uh, an effective tool it is in in what setting it's really just a blunt tool. I also heard that practice-based research networks may be a good platform to explore these questions. 
and also heard from many people that um, the outcomes should be measured more holistically and not just a discrete, you know, time to TPA or something like that. We need to look at uh, other things, which include uh, factors in the rural and frontier communities. And then just lastly, that rural and frontier communities are not, uh, you know, a homogenous mix. There's, there, it's a pretty heterogeneous um, uh, environment and we need, when we study this, we need to be mindful of the environment in which we saw effectiveness. Thank you. Maiva Kwong. Melinda Davis. I, I have three things kind of to take home to emphasize and Kelly, I'll say they echo much of what you just shared, but. First, I want to just strongly encourage folks to align with existing infrastructure, such as by partnering with PBRNs who often uh, have trusted relationships, have experience blending QI and implementation science, and work across diverse settings. I think that that alignment is critical. Um, I think prioritizing attention to the primary care foundations, and so thinking about the staffing, relational development, and quality improvement infrastructure. And then finally, really highlighting that we need studies that have methods to account for characteristics of rural, like small sample sizes and heterogeneity. So using methods from participatory science, implementation science, and pragmatic research to really identify what's working, as well as what matters to patients and providers in these settings. Thank you. Mary Joy Garcia Dia. Hi, good afternoon. My session focused on barriers and facilitators, and I think the key for success with any of these project implementation is to always look at people, process, and technology in the planning, design, and build of the system. Uh, by engaging with clinical informatics specialists to bring to bridge that gap in the plan, design, and implementation to support telehealth will alleviate the barriers related with scope, budget, and timeline. This will also ensure that the telehealth strategy and proposed workflow solutions will improve the communication and workflow processes between the providers and other care teams, which ultimately will provide a successful patient care and provider experience in adapting and utilizing telehealth, either in rural areas or urban poor minority groups. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Krupinski. Yeah, there's been so much already said, but um, from my panel, as well as some of the others, I think, again, sort of three key things that I came away with is the, the need for uh, more focus on interoperability of systems, of electronic medical records, and development of standards to go behind that. But they have to be standards that everybody uses in, in the same way. I always think back to DICOM. Uh, we use it in radiology all the time, and it was supposed to be the standard to make everybody communicate. Yet this vendor has this DICOM vanilla, somebody has chocolate DICOM, somebody has strawberry, and so it's not perfect, but I, I think that's key. And then just to focus on workflow and whether that's done through implementation sciences, whether that's done through standard operating procedures or curriculum development, uh, that's another key issue. And then the final is uh, curriculum development and taking all of this back a step uh, into our curriculum so our future generations uh, can really utilize telemedicine in a way that's been optimized. Thank you, Elizabeth. Anna Bastos de Carvalho. Marcia Ward. Hi, um, we talked a lot in our session today about methodological challenges. I think I have not heard anybody suggest team science and clearly with provider to provider uh, consultations, it really is about expanding the team. I have heard people talk about the importance of relationships in this team and maturity of the telehealth implementation. I think those are all very important to take into consideration. Um, and one other point is I'm looking at the key questions for this whole workshop. And the first one is what's the uptake of different types of provider to provider telehealth in rural areas? And I don't think we have a clue what the answer is to that. 
I don't think um, the data, we don't have the data sources uh, to be able to answer that. And that's a really key question. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Marsha. Laurie Usher Pines. Yeah, I, I agree with um, many of the prior comments. The only thing I might add is, you know, the importance of thinking about this um, from an equity perspective and, and the fact that we are, you know, focusing on rural populations in and of itself is, um, you know, applying an equity lens here because we're, we're looking at a unique disadvantaged population. Um, but in general, you know, one thing a lot of us are worried about is that, you know, telehealth, a lot of great work, you know, in the early days of this field was focused on rural populations and improving access to care. And as telemedicine gets more widespread, including provider to provider, you know, telehealth, um, as it gets more widespread, uh, there's always the risk that um, uh, will exacerbate existing inequalities uh, in, in the system. And so I think it's important that, you know, as this field grows, that we're still, you know, keeping that that equity lens in mind um, and that, uh, you know, as private companies enter the space and perhaps there's more uh, parity and there's just more money to be had that, it, that certain populations are not left behind and we continue to innovate in the rural space. John Cullen. First off, I, I don't envy you all um, on the methodology uh, complications of you know, studying this stuff. I think it, that's incredibly daunting, at least from my perspective as a physician. And I agree with you, uh, Dr. Ward, that I don't think we have a clue how much telemedicine is actually going on, peer-to-peer -peer telemedicine. Um, I use it all the time. You know, I use it every day. And uh, But I don't think that any of those interactions are being captured. Um, and they're not formalized in terms of video presence, but they're, but nonetheless, it's, it's still peer to peer telemedicine. And, uh, and then I agree with Dr. Withy that we do need to have some way of paying for all this. I think that that would make a huge difference. Um, and you, this is one of the ways that we can really treat rare diseases is, you know, if we have tele, if we have that telemedicine lined up so we can actually use it. I could be talking with um, a juvenile onset rheumatoid arthritis specialist in the Mayo Clinic um, in my clinic room, and, and the patient doesn't have to go anywhere. And that would be like a, the holy grail. Um, but we're not there yet. We just don't have any way of coordinating schedules or anything like that. Um, and I think lastly, really important is that um, that training component. Like I said, that's not a bug. That's a feature of telemedicine. And, that, um, and that's something that we should be accentuating as much as possible. But thank you, John, and um, I'll take the last one. My one minute summary is that for echo right now, sort of it's stuck in sort of no man's land. So there's no way to pay for it right now because it's uh, not a one to one patient uh, interaction type of situation or a provider where you have one patient get paid for. And then uh, so I think for sustainability, there needs to be some uh, sort of funding mechanism in the health system for telementoring. And in terms of research, we are sort of caught halfway between two different camps. Uh, there are 157 organizations and CDC and World Health Organization and, and so many federal agencies, HHS ASPER, that already are ECHO hubs and use ECHO. And they think no further research is required. We know it works. It is education. And then there is the people, uh, the researchers who look at an, the research of uh, ECHO and say, you know, the design isn't exactly rigorous enough to reach uh, hard conclusions. So really somehow bridging this divide and creating the evidence base that is required for us to demonstrate that telementoring can be a workforce solution for the United States uh, would be helpful in sustainability. So thank you and back to you, Kate. Thank you, Dr. Rohr. And Dr. Stanley Zeppler um, is now on the line. You had called him in the beginning, but he had audio problems. So we've got one more. Thank okay. you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had some connection problem there. I couldn't move quick enough. Um, I was just going to say this has been a tremendous conference. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, every talk has been been really great. Um, and like I mentioned yesterday. Uh, I think asthma is a unique opportunity to address a high prevalence chronic disease um, that has the potential to morph into uh, COPD. So it's something um, that we need to pay attention to in terms of a pediatric disease, uh, a prevalent disease. And just listening to all these talks, there's a great opportunity to 
um, you take it to another level in care in terms of um, integrating uh, the various educational levels, uh, forming uh, <clears throat> huddles, I think like Dr. Cullen mentioned, um, that where you could bring in uh, various parties and break down silos, the child, the adult uh, caregiver, the school nurse, the primary care clinician, a specialist if necessary. Um, it just presents some very unique opportunities to uh, uh, do things um, in a focused way, but actually advance care in, in a unique way. So thank you for letting me have a little time. Back to you, Kate. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you to all our speakers. You can turn your videos off now. And thank you, Dr. Aurora, uh, for doing that moderation. I will turn it over to Dr. Wakefield now for some closing comments. Just very briefly, I want to say thank you to all the presenters over the last three days. Um, the information, needless to say, has been very uh insightful and uh, helpful. There's been tremendous expertise uh, that panelists have brought and, uh, and speakers have brought to the table for which we are greatly appreciative. I also wanna thank uh, the various federal agencies that have supported this effort, uh, both the workshop itself, as well as the development of the EPC and the document that um, our internal panel will be working on. So many thanks uh, to the sponsoring organizations from across HHS. This really is a shared agenda. It doesn't belong, uh, from my vantage point, to any one part of HHS. Uh, there are many different actors, and it just uh, um, uh, uh, and and so for all of you to come together uh, across the sponsoring organizations and uh, support this effort, I think, is a real uh, testament to that recognition of this uh, of the importance of the topic, and also of the fact that it runs as a as a thread uh, through so much of uh, of what HHS is interested in. I also want to say um, special thanks to Kate Winsack for all of the work in facilitating uh, getting us to this point and to her team uh, as well at NIH. Um, the, we will be, of course, taking the information that's been shared, not just the audience being able to participate and uh, um, and use the information that's been shared, but we'll be taking all of this as a panel and it will drive much of our conversations and development of a document going forward. That work will continue over the next few months, very much informed by all of the uh, speakers uh, and their expertise brought to this. So, so many thanks to each of you. Uh, Kate, with that, back to you. Great, thank you so much, Mary. Uh, so again, just closing comments from me here very briefly. I wanted to thank Dr. Wakefield, you first as our workshop and panel chair for moderating the workshop, and then to all of our other panelists who, as Mary just mentioned, will be working uh, pretty diligently over the next couple of weeks to pull that panel report together. And also to our speakers and our workshop attendees, you all really made this virtual workshop uh, very successful. And I'd also like to thank our P2P planning team. We have been working probably close to two years to plan this workshop, uh, so we were all happy to, to see this day come, and so that includes our our scientific colleagues at NIH is NCATS and NHLBI, also at HRSA and at CDC. And thank you also to the NHCIT and WESTA team. Uh, so a couple of reminders that we've already said today, but they're still important. You have a couple opportunities to comment. So review and comment on the draft systematic evidence review, which is open now, will be open for public comment uh, for a month. And you can find that um, link on prevention.nih.gov. And then, as we've said before, please review and comment on the panel's draft report that they're putting together now that will be available in February 22, and we will send a notice out to everyone when it's ready. That will also be on the ODP website. And then lastly, today or tomorrow, you will receive an email with a post-workshop survey link. Uh, we really strongly encourage everybody to fill that out. It helps us improve uh, the Pathways to Prevention program for our next workshop. So that is it. I will, uh, with that, I will close the workshop. Thank all of you for attending and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.